two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventures piteous overthrows do with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove is now the two hours traffic of our stage, the which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. <laughs> Go me. Go me. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Teacup for One movie marathon. My name is Matt, and I have two degrees, and I have been waiting for this month, for this movie marathon month, for well over two years. The timing just never really worked out, but you know what? Here we are. It's April. It's Shakespeare month. For the next four weeks, we're going to be coming together to talk about some like one of my favorite film genres, Shakespeare movies. Shakespeare movies have the potential to be so good, as well as the potential to not be that great. But I think we, we lined up four of them that, for the most part, I think are pretty good movies and one that I'm willing to revisit and maybe have my mind changed on but that that's a conversation for two weeks from now tonight we are starting off strong with a favorite of many many people like shakespeare lovers and non-shakespeare lovers alike and well i say by many people i have discovered shakespeare fans shakespeare enthusiasts can be very passionate and this is a movie that i learned firsthand um a lot of diehard shakespeare fans hate <laughs> uh i i i guess i kind of know why I'm not one of them anyway. We're talking tonight about Baz Luhrmann's William Shakespeare's Romeo plus Juliet, the Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes vehicle, Verona Beach, California, swords or firearms. It's 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 a good time to be had by all. All right. So let's see who do we have here in the chat tonight. We have my mom. Oh, no, wait. This is my cat talking through my mom's account. This is Sabrina. I like Romeo and Juliet, but it needs music. You would like West Side Story, Sabrina. We have Eliza. She's watching Palm Royale tonight. She doesn't care about Shakespeare. Understandable. And Martha's here. Delightful. All right. Well, let's bring in our guests for this evening. We have our first guest, a teacup for one staple. You know them. You love them. It's Alex Titai, everyone. Hi, Alex. Hey, everyone. How are you? I'm good. 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 Um, I do have a little bit of issue with your uh, little opening lines there, uh, nice. ripped from the uh, the play of the great bard himself. Yeah, of course. Sir of course. James Shakespeare. Yeah. And and pray tell. Well, well, you're doing it all wrong. You How know, so? especially for well, I mean, you know, you were kind of like uh, doing this whole sort of like, you know, intense, like not too intense, but you know that that sort of like that like. That like, oh, look at me, I'm uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, and I say things intensely, and that's why I, I do all, all my acting. But, uh, but that's not the way you should have done it. You should have done it like a newscast, like a newscast, uh, report, right? So, dear uh, friends, Romans, countrymen, welcome to Dear Verona. Uh, I'm just standing outside of the uh, building now. Uh, looks like uh, Juliet and Romeo are going to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, things did not go down that uh, that well, Ooh, folks. Uh, looks like there's a bit of blood. Not too much blood. In fact, there's, this movie is lacking lots and lots of blood, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, a little bit of blood and uh, death and woe. Uh, such is the tragedy tale. Back to you, uh, James uh, Shakespeare. Did you even watch this movie? The, the newscaster was so solemn. She's like, Two households. Well, uh, forgive me. All right, I I was going to uh, going to provide a you know more apropos, accurate uh, you know uh, simulacrum uh, performance, but uh, you were you were interrupting me and uh, and and right. me on. So I just I just kind of no, it was it was a good inform my delivery. Fine. It was it's a good performance. It was a good performance. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're done here with your introduction. Let's move on to our next guest for tonight. We'll have more. I, I'm excited to hear what you have to say, Alex. But let's uh, bring in Jeanette, everybody. Look, it's Jeanette. Hello. 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 Welcome, hello. welcome I, back. Yeah. Yeah. So I got distracted both by, I thought you were about to say something. Then Yoda for Mark chimed in. I like Romeo and Juliet, Taylor's version, three and a half minutes with a happy ending. Yeah, Taylor did write. <sighs> yeah. 
I'm so tired of Taylor. Anyway, oh, whatever. I kind of am too, but I think Taylor is. Yeah, Taylor Swift. Oh, I could. Pr- I prefer more Taylor Kitsch. Uh, he played a fabulous uh, David Koresh, much as Alex would play right now. Um, yeah. uh, possibly, Probably. possibly Tom Hanks in Castaway. Um, yeah, yeah, good oh. job. Get it, I get it. All right, yes. all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apropos. Uh-huh. Anyway, yeah. Uh, Jeanette, what is your favorite Romeo and Juliet adjacent movie? Like, non direct adaptation, but I'm thinking like a West Side Story, a Nomeo and Juliet. Um, Fern Gully. Fern, is that a Romeo and Juliet, really? It's not. It's just two different worlds coming together. And I couldn't think of a better one that I actually enjoy that much. Can I say Into the Heights? Yeah, that's wait, not into really the high, into the woods. Sure, if that's on the table, I'll take that one. <laughs> I don't, I don't find a lot of things that are Romeo and Juliet inspired are not my favorite things, uh, and we'll find that out through the course of tonight. Uh, I find them, yeah, I think I fall on the side of the adults. Oh, in this one. I mean, the adults are right. <laughs> I'll just get that out of the way. Or not even the adults, just just the just the preacher guy. Like you guys are stupid, but if you're gonna do it, fine. Yeah. Well, actually, all the adults have a lot of issues in this, but it's because of them that like the kids who have just listened to their parents. No one would have died. It is the first tale of you screwed me up, I screwed you up. Now we're all screwed up. Like and you know who's so screwed up? Uh like. I had one of those perspective shifting moments when I was studying this play at one point in my life. And someone pointed out that the nurse is so messed up. You think she's the sympathetic character and like, she's there to help, but she's really not like what no. an adult who is supposed to be responsible for a 14 year old girl is going to conspire with her and be like, here, marry this guy you just met. Like she's just so desperate for the approval of this bratty teenager yeah that she, anyway we'll get into it let's bring Uh-oh. in our next guest for this evening i'm so excited to have her back on the channel you know her you love her i don't have a witty intro like chris bond would on we like theme parks but she's a disney bounder it's miriam everyone Woo! hi Yay! i'm miriam. I'm so excited to be here and talk about this oh, i'm um, so excited to i think i might be the only romeo plus juliet lover in this <laughs> chat it seems like so far we'll see i think we're all likers yeah. I'm a lover. Yeah, I, like I told you. I told you this off air. I watch this like once a month. So, yes. oh no. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yeah, I watch this, this version once every two years. So sorry, just drop something. Uh, yeah, this version, in fact. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Hey, so, Miriam, <laughs> you see the of Romeo and Juliet, like the text and overall, or this movie specifically. Uh, this movie specifically and um, original West Side Story. Oh, I would say. ooh, not remake. I prefer remake. Hate remake one with a passion. With a, I, know, so I don't hate it, but it's not as good. It's better though. It's better, but it's not as good, mm, right? Yeah, because no, not as good because yeah. it's better. That's why. Mm, no, no, see, it's, it's not. It. it doesn't reach the level or surpass the level. No, it transcends. Of, of no. good, yeah. it transcends. It's so. Yeah. So not good. It transcends to the plane of not goodness. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but you, you had your chance to have this discussion with us two and a half years ago, Alex. So you, you weren't there. Yeah, I probably hadn't seen the movie by, by that point. No, you had not. We had, we had Brent. Brent was great. Brent sounds great. He, Brent, Brent is great. That was the only time Brent was I don't know if he is great. Sounds great. Was great. Yeah, is Brent, great. That's, uh, you know, jury's still out. No, no, Brent's great. I mean, Brent, Brent here. I don't see Brent. Actually, I don't even think he really watches the channel. Brent usurped the role of Bernardo from me in the Mississauga Community Theater production. We were both. See, in. this, this, these details are starting to add up to somebody who's not that great. No, no, but but he was a better Bernardo than I would have been. Well, then he didn't usurp it. He justly received the role. <laughs> <laughs> My thing. Okay, okay. This is this is the T. <laughs> For the Meadowville Music Theater production of West Side Story from 2004 or five, I don't know if this has ever been publicly stated, but, but, but Brent was brought in at the last minute to join this cast. Like I think an hour or two before our first rehearsal, and I eventually saw his script. It was the Bernardo script, the one that had in Sharpie written on it Bernardo, and then underneath Bernardo was written the name Matt. It was then crossed out, and underneath that name was Brent. So I think, Escondolo. I think I was going to be Bernardo, but then something happened in like that one hour before rehearsal when he agreed to do it, 
and then it became his role. Maybe, maybe he was originally offered the role. Maybe he turned it down for some mysterious reason. Maybe, and but then I was at the auditions though. Like he wasn't there. I know for a fact he wasn't in the original well, of auditions. Maybe Brent is so talented and and worthy that he's offer only. That is possible. That yeah, he's very talented. Yeah, uh, Brent, if you're watching this. Um, let us know. By the way, let's talk about Romeo or Baz Luhrmann's William Shakespeare's Romeo plus Juliet. Is it uh, Boz or is it Baz? I don't know, actually. Is it Or is it Baz? Doctor, who knows? Is it Boz? Baz. All right. We can go with the Boz. It's a bit okay. more fancy, but grander, grander. Boz. Sounds nice. Boz. Boz. Boz Luhrmann's. Or Boz. Boz Luhrmann. Shall we? Okay. Boz? Not so. <laughs> uh, yeah. This movie, this this is an interesting one for me because I really didn't like this movie the first time I saw it. And I still like to think I don't like Boz, Buzz Lerman. But I'm realizing generally I like most of his movies. I just passionately dislike Moulin Rouge. But this is a film that I grow to love more and more with every viewing. Like I get more out of it every time I revisit this film to the point where like I'm almost comfortable saying I love this movie. Almost. There's like one just let it go. Thing. Let it fly. Right, but there's one, there's like one thing for me that's keeping it from being a truly great film. And it is the thing that for me has always been my issue with Romeo and Juliet. I mean, outside of the text, the text makes no sense. It's he's gonna say it. favorite Shakespeare play. <laughs> bye bye, bye bye, bye bye. I have never seen a production of Romeo and Juliet, film or stage, where Romeo and Juliet are both good. There's usually one that's really great and the other one is lackluster or sometimes bad. Um, I've yet to see a Romeo and Juliet where they're equally balanced and both really great. And this is no exception, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, let's uh, start with our opening question, which I've kind of already moved to, which is, do you remember the first time you saw the movie? What was it like? And how does it hold up now? Let's say Miriam for last, because I feel like Miriam's answer is going to make me the happiest and the most excited. Uh, let's start with Alex. Um, I, I saw it previously. I did. Well, I don't know if that I've ever watched the full thing. Uh, the only time I remember watching it at all is it at school, uh, during whatever, whether it was a drama, probably a drama class, maybe an English class, but in any case, we were looking at Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet specifically. And yeah, I, I remember we threw this on and I don't remember if we just saw like a bit of it or clips or I mean, this was back in the day, back enough in the day that, you know, YouTube clips wouldn't have really been a thing, but um, at least not in classrooms. But um, but yeah, you know, like uh, that's what I remember. And I remember not liking it. Uh, agree with you. I, it was also it was relatively speaking around the time that I was first kind of being introduced to Shakespeare and, and diving into Shakespeare as it were. And yeah, like you said, Romeo and Juliet, like the text, it's not, it, it's, um, you know, it's full of those like, Oh my God, why are you doing this? Why'd you do this? Why they, you know, like it's full of those moments, like basically a nonsensical kind of narrative. Uh, like just, just tell them this, just talk to each other, just whatever. Um, don't kill yourself. Why are you killing your, anyway, um, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so basically I feel like maybe some combination of first learning about it and feeling like, ah, Roman and Juliet's not the most compelling story. And then seeing this kind of like version and it was all, it was, it was, you know, it's already your kind of first being introduced to the Shakespearean text and you're kind of tackling that. And I didn't have like a huge struggle with it. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, proud as it were to say, but like, Still, you know, I'm 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 setting my creating my mode in my brain of okay, here's the Shakespearean interpretation mode, and then to throw on this like modern aesthetic, and it was you know combobulating or discombobulating, having like modernly dressed people with guns uh, speak in Shakespearean text and like yelling it out, and oh, that throws you off. Good luck next week. Well, it doesn't throw me off now. It threw me yeah. off when I was you know in grade nine or whatever grade I was six. Uh, probably, yeah, probably close, but yeah, probably six, seven, somewhere around there, seven, eight, seven, eight. It was probably, it was, it wasn't six. It was seven, no, probably. It, it might've been six, no, six, no. but I think it was seven or eight. And how, um, how, how does it hold up for you now with your viewing today? I think you watched it today, yeah? 
Well, you know, that's neither here nor there. I, I you know, I plead the, plead the fifth. But um, uh, no, yeah, I think uh, I like it. I, I had a good time. I thought, I thought it was really entertaining. I thought what the director did, like all the directorial choices. I oh, think, that, I think. So good. Yeah, saying. yeah. Like it's like, yeah, the cuts, the things they focus on, just the, the way everything looks and is presented. I think all that's super entertaining. I think I have a number of nitpicks. That don't didn't actually take away my enjoyment of the product, but it took away my ability to invest in the story. So there's a couple of things that I find the modern setting and the use of guns, etc., and some of the some of the the changes they made to the text in terms of order. I think they did change some order of the text. Um, little things like that that kind of I I took note of, and I thought, ah, this doesn't like the the the. the Plot points of Romeo and Juliet, and and like if you can take rip the text, ex, you know, straight from the book, we're not going to change the text to accommodate the modern setting. This really doesn't work, or you know, I, this I have a list like that too. It's just a piece of paper that says Leonardo DiCaprio like seventeen times in a row. It's um, not just Leonardo DiCaprio, and no, 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 no. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So uh, I liked it though. I had a good time. <laughs> oh my god! Can I? All right, I'll start my bit with this. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I felt creepy watching <laughs> anybody make out on screen. For the first yeah, time that was a little life, yeah, that was a little weird. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I don't know, guys. Like they're in a pool and they're half naked, and I'm thirty six. How old, they, how old were they? Don't know. You know? They were. I was like, <laughs> I don't. I feel I was, like Leo was twenty one. She was, or she was or sixteen, and he was uh, twenty one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. In the nineties, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Fun, fun fact. No. Was, was to, was Korean, but she was like twelve, and they thought. Regardless, this it's fine for them between them. It's just, yeah, like, yeah, for yeah, the first yeah, time yeah. in my life, yeah. I actually had that realization where I was like. So there's one one new aspect of it for my rewatching. Uh, I'll take it from Yoda from Art. Um, my my first viewing, I loved this movie. I was obsessed because I was 11 and Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes, and I didn't know I was bisexual yet. So, yay for me! <laughs> it was just great. When you're 11, that's okay. That's how Vince felt watching Footloose. Yeah. <laughs> I was 11. It was okay. So, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I loved it. And then every rewatching since, I've been like, artistically, I love this movie. Mood and theme-wise, Romeo and Juliet has never been my ish. So, but that's, you know, I also don't like chick flicks or a lot of super romance-focused stuff that doesn't involve the supernatural or blood or things like that. So admittedly, as I grew older, it wasn't going to be in my bag anyway. Uh, I That said, I loved it. I love rewatching it. Like, I just, it's not my story and it always frustrates me at the end. That's just Romeo and Juliet. That's how it is for one reason or another. I'm just like, you guys are crazy, but these adults are also crazy. But these two adults in the in-between it's also a class statement. Like, if you don't get super rich, you don't get super crazy. Like, I, you know, like, there's a lot of things that can be taken out of this. And I can see that more as I get older. Whereas when I was younger, I was just like, sounded cool, sounded awesome, thought that's how love went, got to be about 16 and went, don't do that. <laughs> so, yeah, that was <laughs> it's about, I just, I do love this movie visually. Like, to me, it's, it, like almost untouchable uh I'll, we'll speak on it later but the cinematographer the cinematography both amazing oh, so good agreed hard agree all right miriam let's hear it <laughs> tell us about this movie tell us about when you first saw it tell us about what you love about it just let's go all of it uh yes this movie came out when i was 10 but i wasn't allowed to watch it because it's crazy. <laughs> so my parents, I think, saw the preview with all the guns and they're like, no. So I didn't see it until ninth grade and um, changed my life. I, we watched parts of it in an English class with the best teacher I've ever had in my life. She hated this movie. And so we only saw the clips that she hated. She didn't show us like the stuff that was good. She only showed the parts that she made her really mad. 
So of course it made me go home and watch the watch it. And I was like, no, you're wrong. This is the best thing that's ever happened. <laughs> um, this movie influenced my love for hair and makeup, for costumes, costumes in my real life, like real clothes. The story that's told just through the fashion of this movie was life changing to me. I think about the opening scene with the boys at least once a month. I don't know what it is about that. It's so dynamic though. And there's always like, like these books I'm reading right now, there's a group of boys and I'm always thinking the boys, the boys in the beginning of this movie. Like, it's just like an impact to me for that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've just always loved it. And I think like all the criticisms we have for the story of Romeo and Juliet, I don't know. I love romance and things like that of that nature. I have never looked at this movie and thought this is a romantic movie ever. I've never looked at Romeo and Juliet. I don't think people think this is a romantic thing to do or a smart thing to do. Maybe the time it was written when actual 14 year olds were getting married, they're like, oh, this is romantic. But any other context outside of William Shakespeare's actual timeline, everyone I know that enjoys this play and likes this story has never been like, yeah, that's a great ending and really smart. And this is love. I don't, I, even at 14, when I watched this, I wasn't like, that's love. I'm like, you idiots, you could have thought of any other way. Also, Friar Lawrence, go to jail. This is the worst plan ever. <laughs> like, you're going to pretend to be dead. Like none of this makes sense. Just steal her in the middle of the night and take her to Romeo. All hey, of this it was called. good enough for Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> yeah, it's so stupid. So, but I, I knew that from the beginning. Doesn't make me enjoy it any less or be any less devastated at the end. But I'm devastated because there was another way. And I think that's what this whole thing was trying to say. All of, all of the choices in this movie or this play, there was another way and the characters always chose wrong. And this brilliant teacher told me once, because we also learned Hamlet that same year, and she said she taught them together because they have opposite problems. Hamlet acts way too slow. He cannot get the ball rolling on what he needs to get done. And Romeo, slow down, my guy. Like, what are you doing? Everything he does, it's like right in that moment but he has the thought. It's he does so it, teenage you know? boy, right? Like that's yeah, and he he wrote it's so accurate. Romeo. He wrote Romeo first and loved that character so much. I think that he's like, I'm gonna do it again in Hamlet. But what if I did the opposite? And so I always I always like to think like if Romeo was Hamlet, this would have gone different. He probably oh. never would have dated Juliet. To be honest with you, <laughs> been so slow that it never would have taken off, and maybe we'd be better off. I always I, I always forget that that Romeo had another chick before, like until oh, I watched it or read it. Yeah. yeah, like I'm she's like, never dude. she's never depicted anywhere. She's only talked about. Although we get no. to see her in the Zeffirelli movie. She's like an actual actor in the ball scene and they, they highlight her. But I think that's the only time aside from the movie Rosalind, which is a, a hoot. And I recommend everyone yeah, watch. Very fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, because yeah. she was probably two years older than Juliet and uh, and smart. <laughs> so, I don't think yes. Juliet's the problem here. Just no, say. I'm just saying, like, as far as teenage boys go, moving on to the next, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, like, it almost makes me wonder if Rosalind had said yes, would they have had the same issues? Because I think Rosalind's a Capulet as well. Or at least, like, she's at the party. Yeah, so, she, she's yeah. Capulet adjacent at the very least. Yeah, so, so like, it's just Funny. the issue here that, like, Juliet's the one who said yes to him and he just went for it? Because, I yeah. Who knows? I don't know. That was, I always forget about it, though, until I watch it and I go, oh, yeah. He could have just waited for a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know, right? He's he's heartbroken at the beginning, right? So like or not heartbroken, but he's in, in turmoil and heartache. Right. So he's he, he wants Rosaline or Rosalind, but he, he can't yeah. have her for some reason. We don't know what that reason is. Right. But there clearly is a reason. So, you know, it's not oh, it's, it's not total. clear that something would have happened between them. Yeah, she probably said no to him. She, yeah, she probably said no to him, or yeah, yeah. I had, well, when I first yeah, watched this movie, I thought that he was talking. So, like, not having read it at the age of eleven, just watching the movie, that was my first. This was my first exposure to the story of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> my uh, mind was so, whispering. So, like, I thought he was talking about Juliet, 
I thought he was already longing for her. So rewatching it might as well be and realizing that he's talking about another woman and how fast he moved on put a totally different spin on that character for me. I was like, oh, yeah. he's, he's an talking idiot. About somebody totally different. He just came out of a relationship. What a dummy. Every every problem in this movie is the fault of three idiotic men. Mercutio, <laughs> Tybalt, and Romeo. But Romeo being the biggest idiot of all. Oh, I, no, I, I don't know. know. That, that well, Capulet yeah. mother is a bit of a, is a, oh, I of love a pot her. stirrer. Let's take, okay. let's take a moment to appreciate the, the absolute queen that is Lady Capulet, both in this movie and in the text. Swinger extraordinaire, <laughs> pot stirrer extraordinaire. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Who knows what she's doing? I, I love her. I love this actress. I love this. Like, for me, this is the definitive, perfect portrayal of Lady Capulet. It's almost like the, the Sith Lord or dark side version of Juliet. It's like, I was married when I was 14. I resent everything. I hate you. I'm in love with Tybalt, but I can't tell anyone. Now he's dead. I, I And she has that really great line, like, I, some, it's not I wash my hands of you, but something like that. And yeah. Like, I'm done yeah. with you or whatever. But yeah. It's so good. And what I loved I, when I was rewatching it right before this, um, one of like the most basic Shakespeare things I try to attune myself to is the use of like either you or thee. And I think that's the first time she calls Juliet by thee. She's like, I'm done with thee, mm. which is such a fatal, like crushing blow. Because before that, it's always you, which is in Shakespeare terms, like, how you address someone that you either respect or, or know personally. For. Yeah, yeah. Whereas with the, it's either like disrespect or it's super informal. So just that shift. Oh, it's so good. And the actress is so good. And I like that. They just really went with, she's got a thing going on with Tybalt in this movie. That actually reminds me of one of the inconsistencies. It's, it's one of the more minor ones, but as a, as a quick, relatively quick example, like when in that scene that you're referencing, when she's done with Juliet, just prior to that uh, is the angry Italian father uh, shtick. And, and she's, so she kind of, it, Lady, Lady Capulet comes in and, and delivers the, the father's message to Juliet, you're going to get married on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And Juliet, you know, basically says, nah. And the mother's like, she gets all kind of cold or, and, and kind of like what you're saying, you know, let's say whatever Sith Lord uh, uh, Juliet or whatever. She's like, oh, tell him yourself. And then like, Go turns to the father and like she refuses fuck her up and then i mean beep her up and yeah. then uh and then, and then angry father happens and then lady capulet's like uh jumping on his back and being like stop it you beast you beast slow down what are you doing and then immediately when once he goes away then she's like fuck you juliet <laughs> and and so it's like now that that was relatively minor because I, I the acting like was so maybe, good maybe it is kind of inconsistent but i think it's also i don't know if they added the like the don't touch the, like the don't don't because i don't think that's in i agree text. uh but i feel i think it's just the difference of she's kind of over her family but at the same time she doesn't want to see her her daughter being physically manhandled and potentially thrown off the staircase oh i agree I, yeah. I i think there's a I, I don't i'm not i would i wouldn't you know i'm not arguing that like there's no universe where that like those behaviors don't make sense lined up it's more so just there's a it's a, it was minorly you know inconsistent i thought like it just the way the way it played on screen me seeing the sort of like coldness go to the defensiveness going back to this sort of like snideness from the mother there was just less of a through line for me there not to say that the through line couldn't you know i've always justified. read it a different way whereas she's like oh you think that if you don't marry paris that you're gonna have a better life like let me show you what's actually gonna happen if you refuse mm -hmm. this six the father on her and then is upset because it's happening and then when she when the father walks away like i told you this is what your life will be like if you don't go do this Ooh, I like you that. think you're smart, but you're not like you got to you got to do what we're saying or your dad's going to like be way worse and you might not survive it. Yeah, I think you're going to stay a in point. a mafia family. You're going to stay yeah. in a corrupt family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And yeah, what I love, an I love the direction of that scene just because of how terrifyingly angry and violent he is, because I think it needs to be mm -hmm. that heightened for me to accept the actions that happen after like why Juliet is so willing to take poison or fake drug mm -hmm. poison from a priest. And like, 
and uh, like th those are the story beats that make no sense to me usually when i see romeo and juliet that just make me think why are you doing these things they make no sense but to have something that's that heightened and that terrifying it kind of puts it into a perspective where like i get it like in her shoes i would feel like i have no other options because my angry dad almost threw me off the stairs and now my mm -hmm. mom's washed her hands of me and my nurse is like no you tried we're done here <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so it's a good uh, scene also good. you know like the scene that I really remember him in also is the party scene. And you're getting this like jovial, like seemingly like, yeah, party tolerant. Guy. And he's also telling Tibble, like, God, you're being annoying. Don't start a fight in here. I don't care that Romeo is here today. We'll deal with it later. Like, just yeah. have a good time. Like, let's let it go, whatever. So you're getting that like version of him. And yes, he does get ugly with Tibble at the end when he's not listening, but he's not listening. So it's kind of like, <laughs> I'm the boss, my guy. What are you talking about? So I think to like really get us to understand how bad it is, we had to have the, the violent scene with Juliet. Otherwise, you're like, he's a fun party dad. I don't know. Like, is it that bad, girl? Why are you going to? Yeah, party? yeah. I, I just, I love how he's not unreasonable towards the beginning i feel like mm -hmm. if you were to look at how much text that character has i don't know for a fact but i'm assuming it's not a ton but there's just so much there with him mm -hmm. that i love and like it's a fully realized character and like just through circumstances and through the bit of text he has it's so good it's so mm -hmm. good it's, yeah while well, the shakespeare is so good um all right I kind of had talking points, but we just kind of naturally flowed into places I wanted to go anyway. Let's talk about, here we go, Mrs. Sprout, the nurse. What does everyone think of Miriam Margoyles as the nurse in this movie? <laughs> Juliet! <laughs> Juliet! <laughs> I, like, oh. I, I question if that's, if, if it, is it a stereotype? Is this an inappropriate portrayal? Who knows? Maybe, yeah, who knows? I mean, it's... it's but I still really like it. Somebody with, certainly somebody who's you know, like used to speaking a certain way, you know, whose mother tongue is, you know, all, you know, presumably Hispanic, like the, that would make sense. Right. And there would be, you know, there would be prime to pronounce J's in that way and, and whatnot, you know, is it, is it, I don't know what the, I, I actually don't have a sense of, of, you know, what somebody of that like ethnicity or, or, or mother tongue if they're how difficult it would be for them to say a hard, you know, a hard J versus a versus not and, and, and whatnot. But it was just, it was, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was a choice. It was a choice, but I love, I just love how fully realized her character is, even if it is likely a stereotype that maybe it's offensive. I don't know if it is. I feel like it might be, but she still really finds the humanity of it. I think. And the, like her command of the language is just so good. I just have this thing where I really like hearing, Shakespearean text delivered in different accents and different dialects like um like well you don't really have it in this movie but there are some TikTok videos where people do it in like a southern accent which... yeah that's going around right now like that it like the iambic pentameter like you can actually understand it and it makes sense like with the cadence of a southern accent oh, it's like so it's easier southern... to pick up on Southern is most directly, like, Southern accent is either most directly related to French or British, depending on what part of the South you're from. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. like, if I had a Southern accent, it would be French. Like, my mom has a, you know, that's the one it would fall under. But then certain, like, the Carolinas fall under, like, a British sounding mm -hmm. uh, dialect. Yeah, they so were, that's where it derives from, anyway. What I watched today was saying the closest match is Appalachia is the closest Southern yeah. accent to... Some, um, like the mid Atlantic Southern yeah. states, like that I don't even call Southern. Like they're mm -hmm. they're mid Atlantic. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, there's just there's such a auditory beauty I think to hearing like that heightened text in some type of some type of accent. Like whether I think we're also used to hearing it in British because of like because Shakespeare, mm -hmm. England, but like even the Spanish accents we have in this movie, or even Benvolio's like Californian, like surfer douchebag accent kind of works for me the only yeah the only one i don't like is leo and how he speaks but <laughs> yeah but no on, on the subject of the nurse i really liked her i i i thought uh um i thought the actor did a great job of like portraying the um the various 
like goals or things that the nurse was dealing with at any given moment, right? Like in the first, in the first, not the first time we see the nurse, but you know, the most of at the beginning, I think she's just like harassed, like just Juliet, what are you doing? Time for night time or whatever. But uh, when she's when she's gone, sent to to chat with uh, Romeo and report back, right? That whole scene, I thought that was a really interesting scene. Like on the one hand, it's kind of ridiculous. If you if you literally kind of track it, the, the, how 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 kind of um, there's like this competing these competing things where like on the one hand the nurse seems like she wants or she's fine with communicating <laughs> the message and 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 providing Juliet with what she wants. On the other hand, she has I guess in that particular scene she has this sort of like this uh you know this i don't know this like self-righteousness or something where it's like i've just like i'm tired i'm not your like errand woman i'm not you know i'm 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 uh don't just treat me like like you know have concern for me as i don't know a human being or as a, a servant not just as the 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 voice to to the information that you're seeking for anyway but i thought you did that really well i thought and then I, and i it was like in spite of how i find that text to be incongruent or or in or just contradictory uh i i found myself like being okay with it because of of her delivery and and that stands and kind of because then that later on she has the whole at the end her like last scene or so she has that whole thing where she's she's talking about like how good of a match paris is you know and and sort of like paris is better than than romeo and if not romeo is dead anyway so and i just find yeah, there was something where again the text to me is is almost contradictory at these various points, but I found her delivery of them. Uh, I, I think the thing with the nurse cool. is that she is like the self righteous um, element that you mentioned. I think is exactly the key to her. Like I feel like everything that she's doing is just to make herself feel like she is still of importance to Juliet. Like whether or not. It, like I don't think she has any. She's a cool energy. mom. She's the cool mom. Exactly. Yes, she's not a regular nurse. She's a cool nurse. She's at cool nurse with six O's. She's hip. Yes, exactly. She's with it. <laughs> <laughs> on the TikTok. <laughs> well, let's let's dial back. I want to dig back into the costumes, which Miriam kind of mentioned towards the beginning, because especially in the costume party scene, let's let's just talk about that scene because I adore that scene, the party scene, and everything preceding it with Marcuccio is maybe when the movie's at its best, but I don't want to say that because the movie has a lot of really great stuff going for it. But yeah, what's everyone's favorite costume in the costume party scene? Mine is the mom is Cleopatra, but there we go. It's pretty great. It is. Well, I'll go first. Um, first, we got to back up a little bit before the party because the costuming in the boys scene is so perfect. Having the Capulets all in beach, like silk button downs, and like tank tops and stuff. And then having the Capulets like overdressed in this like um, the use. Of, okay. A few years ago, the Met Gala did um, Catholic fashion as the theme. Yeah. I forget yeah. the name, the title of the Met Gala that year, but that was the gist was religious wear like mm -hmm. in fashion. And this I, when that thing came out and everyone's like, I don't get it. Like, why would they do that? I'm like, I know exactly what this is. It's Romeo plus yeah. Juliet. The vest that the Capulets are wearing, like all of the Mary iconography all over this movie, even on their guns, it's like all this religious symbolism, which doesn't really have anything to do with the story, but I think it gives you a sense of place, like kind of still giving you that like Italy type flavor in, um, in Southern California. But really, I think of this movie more as being in Mexico because mostly it was shot in Mexico and you can really oh. see that on film. So it all works for me, but um, having them like so different and that's how I kind of view the Montagues are kind of like just absolutely out of their minds, like doing things really quick and they're really casual, right? And the Capulets mm -hmm. feel more calculated to me. So they're conveying that with the way they're dressing. And then the moment that changed my life is Juliet's costume and it's when you just you see her on, on the balcony looking at the fireworks and you can see her wings but there's a moment in the party when she's turned around and her hair is I still cannot figure out how they did this hair it's so seamlessly beautiful they made a halo out of her hair but it's like perfectly soft and soft in the front 
and it's wrapped around the back of her head. And I just cannot figure out how they did it. And I think about it all the time. And it's so beautiful. And they were trying to convey that she's innocent, angelic, and it's so perfectly done in the costume. And also Mercutio's wig keeps changing in this scene and it's intentional. It does? During, oh yeah. That. Yeah. During when he's giving his whole speech about um the dreams. Yeah. It's like it's a close cropped white um you know curled wig but it's very short and the closer you get to him and the more he's unraveling like they change that wig within that scene so in the beginning it's like it's it's kept and whatever but as he's going more and more crazy the closer they get to him it's like all frizzed out and it's like messed up kind of and then when leonardo cap when romeo is on drugs at the party the wig is longer and bigger and it's because the scene is heightened with him being on drugs. He's seeing yeah. everything bigger, better than it actually is. And it's shown with Mercutio's costume. And it's brilliant. It's so good. And then when they're leaving the party and he's coming down off the drugs, it's back to normal. And it's from the first scene. So I love that. I've never noticed yeah. that. That's amazing. Hairstylist. That's all I can think about. <laughs> <laughs> it's ruined movies before, but not this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so, incredible those are my favorites <laughs> nice i also just love i love you mentioning the hair because my the you had the post on instagram which i reshared that my mom saw it and she essentially said that like all girls had more or less the same experience in the 60s with olivia hussey's hair whatever that looked like oh yeah in the mm -hmm. juliet movie it just seems like every generation has a juliet hairstyle that changes their fashion and their hair uh goals moving forward mm -hmm. Yeah. Just how it should be. Halo's made of hair. Halo's yeah. made of hair. <laughs> <laughs> and if you uh, watch the pool scene, when she falls in, all of a sudden, she has the halo going into the pool, but all of a sudden, it's like all down and perfect. And I'm like, that's not true. It would just be like... <laughs> it would look like a and soft and ruined halo. When she goes into the pool, there, it's just like parts of it hanging down. She loses down. her innocence. So she yeah. loses the halo. Yeah, oh, boy. if only all of our hair looked like that in a pool, it does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, totally unrelated to this. Well, kind of, but also you said pool. I thought about how extravagant their house is. They have like full out public bathrooms in their house. There are urinals in the Capulet mansion. And just yeah. watching the movie recently, I thought that's my new life goal. I want a house that's so big, I can have public bathroom facilities. You don't need a big house. You can just, just make your house a big yeah. urinal. I catered at many houses that had a <laughs> urinal and a bidet and a toilet. Like Really? <laughs> just There's... people just with elevators. Oh my God. And I guess not even just like... the presence of a urinal. Is that they had like three in a row and like bath? Well, that is kind of silly and weird. <laughs> Just make your basement uh, a, a giant public bathroom. <laughs> there you go. Let's know how to party. <laughs> yeah, plus fish tank in the bathroom. Oh my gosh! Just put a fish tank in your bathroom. What's I don't see. <laughs> this is a <laughs> wall that like. The Omar knows. Omar is here. It's Omar. You don't know him. It's I know Omar. Omar. We love Omar. Omar is not Brent though. Omar, we were talking about Brent earlier. Omar knows who Brent is. Omar knows. <laughs> Maybe Omar can 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 you know contribute to the discussion of whether or not Brent is currently great. Brent is currently great. <laughs> well, we don't know that. You know, we have, we we have your word, which you know. I still talk to Brent on occasion. He's fine. Well, yeah, on occasion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> A anyway. great occasion. Yes. Let's uh, let's go back to costumes. Yoda's favorite is the astronaut. So Paris. Oh, uh, uh, Paris. Paris. costume. Paul Rudd's character I, feels so out of place in this. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, this Paul is, Rudd's like, so why bad. am I here? This is, this is what's so perfect about this movie is this is how good the directing is. They gave me the ick for Paul Rudd. That has never before I know, before right? Since. And you're supposed to have I the ick bad for Paris. You're supposed to not like... Well, well, where, where, is the like ick, where is the ick for Paul Rudd? I feel like him. Paul Rudd Paris is so appealing. I'm like, Juliet, why wouldn't you go with him? He seems nice. Oh, he's Nerdy compared to Romeo being, but not idiot, in a good way. You know? Like not the good way. In a, like in a white, in a white bread, like not even toasted. Yeah, in a way, like what are we gonna talk about at dinner when we're married forever? Kind of thing. Yeah. And then he got weird and creepy in the church on that one scene. You're like, mm. all right, so you're boring and weird. And creepy? <laughs> yeah. 
Which, <laughs> how, did, cool. how did he oh, get that performance God. out of Paul Rudd? I just need to know. Uh, so good. One right, more thing about the very, sorry. One more thing about the costumes at this party. Um, you know, they're all supposed to like kind of reflect who they are. So, like the astronaut, even he's supposed to be like everybody is enamored with him in society, and like astronauts are cool and big and whatever. But then, I think where this changes is you know Romeo being dressed as a knight. I think that's how he sees himself. That's not oh, how yeah. I see him. That's how he's like. I'm I'm gallons and all this. No, you're not. <laughs> No, you're not. This is all. This actually is a costume for you. Everybody else is believable, except. I mean, what's not gallon about Romeo? I don't. I don't. I don't see. I. Don't, I, don't, I, I, I think. I Romeo's think it's fine. all <laughs> how they see themselves, kind of like honestly, because Cleopatra is how freaking Montague sees herself. That's Montague. I right? think Capulet. that they gave yeah. Julia. Her, okay. I think they gave Capulet. Juliet her costume. I don't think she would have picked that out for her. Well, the Capulets totally gave her her costume. Yeah. I'm a little angel. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe she picked it. I can also see this this Juliet picking the angel wings, like non ironically, just thinking I want to be something pretty, but like I want I have this really nice dress. Let me just put wings on it now. It's a costume. Yeah, I want something that's pure and quiet. That's, I, I actually feel that's kind of that's Juliet would be okay with that. I think Juliet to me, Juliet's like she's 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 like awakened by Romeo. She's not mm -hmm. like, you know, she's she discovers feelings and paths and possibilities with Romeo. But up until then, like, you know, I feel she like she's born probably to be what her parents made her. Yeah. Up until, I mean, I know we have the whole, like, she doesn't seem thrilled about Paris in the first place. There's like discernment there, but yeah, I don't know that we don't have enough of Juliet to, to mm -hmm. kind of go either way. Yeah. You know? Like, do we think Juliet is actually into Romeo or is it just because she feels pressure that she has to marry this other guy that she has to marry Icky Paul Rudd. And now he's just another option is like, here's someone who's not Icky Paul Rudd. This is me trying to claim independence. And what a statement about it. the times too. Let's just say, because Paul Rudd was the Leonardo DiCaprio until Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> came along. Yeah. And then he was the Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio. So yeah. very telling. I kind yeah. of think Paul Rudd played Romeo in this movie. Um, but I think they were That's also just... trying to show like how much older he was by putting him in the astronaut suit. Like he's old enough to be an astronaut. And Romeo <laughs> isn't. You know what I mean? Like Yeah, yeah. I Paul Rudd. They were trying to show like Juliet was about to marry someone much older than her. And that is just all Yeah, right. as the as the times, right? There's a line in the, there's a line in there somewhere about like um I think it's the mother and the father or the father and somebody. Is it the mm -hmm. father who says like let let her like two more summers until she, we can spoil yeah. her or whatever? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. She's um, 16. yeah, yeah, she's yeah. Yeah. She's sixteen, and uh, she's in the text. In the play, she's, 14. she's fourteen. I think she's fourteen. In yeah. the play, she's fourteen, but in the movie, they say it at some point that she's sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. Okay. I am sixteen. So they moved it up by two years, I think, so everybody wasn't all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even <laughs> in the nineties, we didn't want to see fourteen-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah, not that with really parental right. consent. No. Um, <laughs> or, or your nurse present, I guess. Um. Yeah. Yeah. There's a great, there's a great, I, I love the uh, what satisfaction canst thou have line in that mm -hmm. sequence after the costume party. When Roman yeah, and Julia she are, so are static, she like he's, spikes. She, yeah. He's like, will you leave me unsatisfied? And then she like clocks him. Like, yeah, like what, do, what, yeah. what the hell do you think we're going to do, Romeo? <laughs> what do you? No, it really what was. Is, I was like, wow, that was big of the 90s. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, Kudos shit. Kudos to you, girl, for yeah. saying that, for spilling. Yeah. So. yeah because it's, I it's, think it's, in the original play, it was like, what satisfaction wouldst thou have tonight? And then in this one, she's like, ew. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an example of Claire Danes succeeding at taking the text and making it feel modern and infused with life versus mm -hmm. Leo, who did yeah. his own thing. Leo was what? fine, Matt. He, he had a Danes few is... moments at the beginning, and Claire then Danes he was is fine. generally a more subtle actress in general. Like, she's very good at being subtle without being underwhelming or sad looking like Michelle Williams, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> she I gotta come for her every episode don't I I don't oh, mean to good. but it's just my example of not having range like <laughs> Claire Danes has a lot of range 
Yeah, and uh, I think what I'm so, getting at. What I love great too. so much about Claire Danes in this movie that mm. I appreciate more with every viewing is that there's no question to me that even if I don't understand everything she's saying, that she knows everything that she's saying. And I can't say the same as an audience member for Leo, where it feels like he just memorized the order of the words in which yeah. to speak them in his Leo tone that's kind of raspy and kind of charming and kind of empty where he's like ah, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> and i also feel like leo is fighting against the meter and the iambic whereas everyone else to varying degrees of success is kind of embracing it they, but like, yeah, he's, he's the one who's just actively like i'm a modern actor i'm gonna they make gave leo shakespeare lines and said deliver these like james dean and then they gave the rest of the cast the lines <laughs> and said deliver these like shakespeare <laughs> Because I feel like the way he delivers them, almost like scene for scene, the way he throws his hair, everything is very James Dean. It's, it's, uh, it's like... That's just an aesthetic thing. That's it's, just... Uh, no, look, it's, it's an aesthetic I thing. I love the aesthetic. <laughs> I still love the aesthetic, no matter how creepy that is at this age. I love the aesthetic. Yeah, Leo's very uh, cute in the movie. Very, how would we feel about Lydia Tarr? Lydia Tarr <laughs> would have been a better Romeo. Yeah, uh, oh... If yeah, we well, it's all over that take. And but I, agree. I do. So yes, Leonardo DiCaprio, point. at his worst, is still a fantastic actor. Yeah, yeah, this exactly. Is my, this is not my still least believable. favorite. This is not my least favorite. However, I think this is his least talented role Maybe. as an actor. Yeah. It's well, still very good. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that take. Yes, That's moments. probably it. This will sound really shady, but I don't mean it to. I think his best moments are the nonverbal ones. I think when like he has reaction shots, yeah, he he's, has... he's he's a Natalie Portman actor. All right, I heard this this. Oh, uh, did you did you know you knew it? Is that, is that how you're bringing it up? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, Natalie you, you Portman wanna... was supposed to be Juliet. Oh yeah, yeah, and they and they, they said she looked too young. <laughs> no. So I didn't know that, but trivia achieved. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> no, no, but there's uh, there's this uh, theater producer, actor, guy, David Connolly, I think his name is. I know David Connolly. Yeah. I him once. You what? I directed David Connolly once. In what? Nine. You directed a, perform a production of Nine, the musical? With David Connolly, that is correct. I don't believe it, but all right. It, it did. Yeah, okay, allegedly. All right, this is this is all right. Until, uh, what is it? Guilty until proven innocent. All right. So, uh, <laughs> lies until proven true. Um, but no. So he told this anecdote about Natalie Portman, where he was like videoing her for like a something, an audition, a demo, whatever. And she had some, and I don't remember all the details. So, so if David ever sees this, you know, feel free to correct me. Um, but the basic, the premise, the basic, the, the punchline is true, I believe, which is that he feel he's filming her. You know, he's behind the camera, he's filming her, and she has, like, some lines and whatever. And either she, like, doesn't say anything or she, like, misspeaks and, like, says, like, just make stuff up or something. Either way, it gets to the point where David kind of, like, stops and is like, hey, like, you know, you're not saying your lines, you're not saying your lines right or whatever. And then Natalie Portman reportedly, uh, you know, retorts and says something to the effect of, the words aren't important. It, it, it's the eyes. The eyes are all that matter. And 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 then it's that's it. That was his like mic drop. Like well, the mic drop moment in the story, the anecdote was. And you know who said that? Natalie Portman. But um, but the point of the story is that Natalie Portman, as an actor, believes that lines aren't important, <laughs> and that what's important is for an actor is to it, it's 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 expressing the emotions, right? It's it's making yeah. the audience believe that the actor is going through what they claim to be going through, whether it's due to the dialogue or whatever. And I believe that DiCaprio is that kind of an actor. And this movie kind of emphasizes that. We're like, he's not, yeah. He, does he do great with the Shakespearean text? No, but it doesn't matter. We believe Leo. We believe that he's a little boy yeah. going through what he's going through. Do we believe that he knows that he did his homework on Shakespeare and that he knows what he's saying? No, but what little what little 16 year old boy does know what they're saying or 18 year old boy or any boy for that matter. Nobody knows <laughs> what the hell they're talking about. They're just going around trying to, grab things and experience things and and that's all that if is. he did the work alex it would flow and it would feel natural and then i like, don't think it would i think it would have seemed more contrived exactly. i think the fact that his americanness came out in this America. because of the way Boz lerman was depicting it was okay 
I guess, but right. like Claire has, I feel, equal parts Americanness, and it feel like when she speaks, it just seems so natural. It flows because it's she's subtle and soft, and yeah, sweet, and she everything's gonna seem quality. more lies out of her lips, you know. Exactly. There's so much happening in the comments. Hold on. <laughs> First off, Vince believes me. I can't remember the name of the actress who did the Penelope Cruz number, but she is very good. She had a broken arm at the time, and she still did it, and it was great. Penelope yeah, Cruz yeah. wasn't in this film? No, in Nine. Oh. And then I'm saying Claire Danes crying at the end is iconic. The ugly laugh makes him cry. Uh, okay, we'll get there when we get there. Oh, yeah, she's an ugly cryer. Leo's a pretty crier. No, I, I you stars, that's ugly crying. When he's like, he's not really crying there. He's like, he's proclaiming. He's he's desperately and sadly proclaiming. But when he's crying with Juliet, he's beautiful. When he's lying there and on her corpse, and he's all like, oh, he's a, he's so pretty. Yeah. He's beautiful. Her cry yeah. defines <laughs> petulant child. She looks oh, like a toddler that has had her candy taken away. <laughs> <laughs> like it just looks so. I I don't get what I want. Uh, like her cry is so. Uh, that is that's the end of the ending for me. Like I that's the part when I watched it, I was like, oh yeah, she's really annoying right here. I love her the rest of this movie. Uh, it's courage to do the ugly cry. Yeah, so I, I feel it's not courage. I think it was a really real take, and they yeah. just put it yeah, in. Yeah, she's an ugly cry. She, yeah. I think that's what she really looks like when she cries. I agree. I can't control my face that's either when point. I cry. So none of us can. Yeah, it's just honestly, I I cry every time I watch this movie, and it's that audible sob that she does at the end. It kind of like like to me, Leo crying over her isn't that sad, and when she wakes up and sees that he's dying, like it's too much for me. Like, oh my god. So we're kind of there. I want to talk about the ending. We skip um, to the end, but okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. No, well, we can... <laughs> we're, here now. we're here now. The ending. Oh, my gosh. The first time I watched this properly, like as an adult, because I saw it and didn't care when I was a kid and a teenager. The first time I watched it properly, I was shook when I realized how they chopped up the text for the death scene. And it's yeah, one of yeah, my yeah. favorite things about this movie. And I think it's like bleeping brilliant that you go into this Everyone knows they're going to die at the end, even within the text. Like at the beginning, they say they're going to die. And there's all those little moments like spattered throughout when they're like, I feel like I'm going to die from this love. And like, it's no secret. But then they still find a way to shock us by doing that editing so that they can have like a brief moment together, which is just so heartbreaking and yeah. so good. And I didn't realize how well those like chunks of text fit together as a conversation just because mm -hmm. it's written to just be speech and speech. But like, oh, it's so good. That's all I have to say about that. Feel free to weigh in if you agree or disagree, but I love it. I think it's a better ending than the play where she wakes up and he's already dead. It's You get the gravity of what they've done so much worse by her witnessing it, honestly. Um, it, it, is, it is more frustrating, but it's also more powerful. I mean, just you know, so he just keeps looking away every time. Like, he's at her hand and her eyes open. Then he's looking at her face and her hands move. Like, it's so frustrating. And you're just like, slow down, Romeo. You can kill yourself anytime. Just take more time with this. And, uh, you know, you know it's coming. And it's still so sad. Also, walking into that chapel, that's another moment in my life that it's like, oh, this is what I like. The like, yes. neon lights around the flowers. It's so 1996. It's it reminds gorgeous. me of the Madonna. Uh, yeah, it's so uh, beautiful. Like a prayer or just a prayer, whatever. Like that music video. Yeah, I was. So I don't know how he. I don't know how he climbed. <laughs> I don't know how he climbed into her like deathbed without lighting the whole chapel on fire. <laughs> the amount of candles around her is scary <laughs> but well, maybe it's just like a low budget so cremation plan that they have I don't know. Uh, can we talk about can we talk about this for a second the the slight i know there's a lot of realistic incongruities in this movie uh one i think alex was portraying was the lack of blood with all of the guns and knives but the other one was this child is dead not only is it the same day but she's not involved are we she's not embalming not... people now? Because they are. Yeah, she's not investigated. There's no autopsy. There's like, no. They show no... showing up the next day. <laughs> yeah. They show like news report. Like 
all this modern ish, <laughs> but she's not yeah. involved. He's like, your yeah. sticks are still so rose. Like your your liquids have not been sucked <laughs> out of your body. Yeah. Yeah, we don't so know like, what happened. We're just gonna WTF put you here. Mate, don't know. <laughs> People just die sometimes the day before their we wedding. Just let them rot, on, we just let them rot on the table. Rot in the chapel. We put them yeah. out around a bunch of hot candles and yeah. let them rot for yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't we investigate. We don't check. We don't, maybe, we don't open maybe, up. This is, a, this is a mob family. I feel like they just get to do whatever they want. No one yeah. asks questions. They're just like, okay, that's yeah. This is what they that's do. That's the best explanation I've heard. Yeah, yeah, like, but then like yeah, don't like, give us the like really photography weird. yeah mm -hmm. no death don't bring in good. the police person yeah taking pictures and stuff just like skip no. that part <laughs> well oh honestly the police have probably been called there so many times to look away from it that they're like we already know we're not gonna <laughs> do this is so in on it he's letting their children die so that mm -hmm. they can figure ish out they're like he's like everyone has been punished because like everyone he's like Cool your heels. I thought we were done with this. I thought we were done. But I let you guys kill each other. Now are we done? Now we're done. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's so there's so much of that like modern yeah, like I was saying at the beginning, the modern settings sort of you know, whatever, incongruencies, inconsistencies, nonsensicalities is uh there's there's a number of those. But um uh yeah, but, oh. but on, I just wanted to oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I told Matt this off air, but this is another movie, just specifically the movie, where, again, whole story falls apart with one cell phone. One cell phone, story's dead. Nothing. nothing oh, nothing yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can, get, if you can make a call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's well, true. Well, yeah, ninety six. Like, yeah, phone it's on the brink, though. It's on the brink. It is. It's on. Nobody would. They wouldn't have all had cell phones. Yeah, but, like, yeah and he, I'm just saying he wasn't yeah, getting yeah. signal but, out uh, of whatever the cop family. He was at. Yeah, this is this is like Home Alone, though. Like <laughs> one yeah. cell phone, whole story. Shut yeah, up. yeah, yeah. But yeah, my my my, yeah. my my retort to Jeanette was that this is just it's an example that it's a universal thing that the post office is incompetent. It doesn't matter if it's four hundred <laughs> years ago or now. Mm -hmm. Post office, but even that 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 also doesn't make sense. As far as I, I didn't go back to check this, but what I I, I saw it and I saw the, the post office left a note. It showed. I'm pretty sure in the scene where they the come, the guy was the package, showing up right as he drove off. The guy was there. Well, the, the delivery no, 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 no. But even there. no, no. But even before that, before the like Leo actually goes to run off, there's an initial. They have a scene where the post office tries to deliver the package. They leave the freaking sticker on the door, being like, "We just missed you." An oh, urgent yeah. letter delivery, and it pans to Leo like whacking rocks in the air, you know, swatting at, like just playing with a bat, hitting rocks in the desert. Fine, but why show us? Why give us the freaking scene where you're leaving the note on the door or whatever? If that's not going to come into play, because Leo for because then Leo goes on about like, did the priest send me a letter? The priest, well, check yeah, the no, freaking it, door. There's it, a sticker it, on it. It amps up the tragedy that he was so close to missing. There's it. no tragedy. He just it wasn't close. He didn't. He was. If he cared about the letter, he would have probably minded the freaking sign well, on the door that says "Urgent Letter." <laughs> we missed you. <laughs> Call this or come here for the letter that you're crazy about. Like well, anyway, also, it was just. It was I, I, like. Yeah, yeah. The way Balthazar rolls up to be like, get in the car, she's dead. Like, like, yeah. Again, chill. Oh my god, I was obsessed with this character because he's also in uh Bring It On. And he's um, also in Swim Fan, right? That's the same guy, right? Is fan? it? I can't remember. I, I was yeah, more that's Bring the same girl, guy. So uh yeah, but I was just like, Oh my god, chill. Let's Let's talk about this, Balthazar. Can you not like rile him up? We already know he's gonna get riled. So just chill. Calm down, yeah. And in yeah, that initial like, does time not, time. not he does not feel like a natural friend of Romeo's. He feels like somebody hated yeah, he's him wearing him a tie in grade and, and went, like, this guy he... needs a friend. Yeah, is he the Montague's intern? Like, what's going on? I feel yeah. like he was probably an ultra boy like shortly after Romeo. So I got the vibe he's that like Romeo was born an ultra boy. Which mm, was like an altar yeah, boy. like you know, the pre shirtless priest hanging out with the altar boys. Then Romeo's like, "Hey, kids! Hey, priest!" It's like they have this weird little club where uh -huh. they just—that's what we call priest. it—the weird little club. Weird. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ninety-six. That was so uh, okay, right? <laughs> while we're on that note, 
how do we feel about the fact that Romeo might be bisexual in this particular iteration? Oh, well, I think that's a good... Oh, because of his friend, Marcuccio? Move into Marcuccio. Mm -hmm. So, that, hold on, sorry, I want to make give my was, two cents. Oh, okay, okay. He was well, a well, lot yes. more broken up about Mercutio's death than Juliet's. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, he gave a lot more emotion about Mercutio than he did He's about He's known Juliet. him a lot longer. He's known well, Juliet. And he was, and like he was there. Hours, he, so. he, he watched him die, whereas with Juliet, yes. he kind of, he, he defies yes. the stars. He drives there. He walks slowly into the chapel. He's There's a lot of time and processing happening. With Mercutio, he's just, he's right there, and he's like, no, you're going to live, buddy. And he's like, no, I'm, I'm dead. Screw you. Screw your house. And then, <laughs> Wait, but, but, uh, what were you going to say about Balthazar? Was it how he's my lookalike? No, I, I, well, I, I was going to, I was going to say so many things. I, I want, <laughs> I, my desperate plea was to talk about the death sequence. I wanted to stir the pot a little bit of them dying. I wanted to throw in my experience of that moment. Blood. That's perfect. You don't need to stir. <laughs> it's not perfect. So, so. Yeah, that one was interesting because so funnily enough, so I I probably didn't see it to completion uh, the, in, in school that one time. And even if I did, I would have forgotten or I wasn't paying attention or whatever. But so I didn't know what the ending was going to be like. And, like I knew I know the story of Romeo and Juliet, but yeah. the way once Romeo is with Juliet and Juliet starting to like move and stuff, I was like my brain kept thinking like I didn't know what the movie was trying to do. So I was like, are they going to? wake Juliet up and like, are they going to be happily ever after? Is that the movie's twist? They're going to like subvert the plot and give us a happy ending. Um, and then they, you know, they, they kind of, so, so there was like that moment I was like, like, okay, okay. Anyway, long story short, I, I, like, I thought the, the, it does make like the, the, the giving them that moment and having Juliet witness Romeo dying live in living color. Um, does make that moment even like it amps the tragedy it's already tragic if they just miss each other by you know uh a second as is originally written this is even more tragic um and it did it like it it penetrated my my void you know empty heart but only Alex for a second three sizes that day <laughs> only for like a second it they, it hit me like a, a moment and then i started like Crying. acknowledging what was going on and it's a it's a weird moment for me basically like, basically my point is is that i can see it believable in one way which is and what i'm referring to is juliet's lack of epic reaction immediately right like juliet's kind of juliet witnesses and then him drinking poison and then this like horrible moment happens where she's staring at him and i'm like holy crap this is terrible and I guess you can spin it as like, okay, she's like kind of, she's recovering from the thing. She's shocked to see what she's happening. She starts going through the rationalization of, oh, like, uh, I guess I can die too and everything will be okay. Um, and it's not quite striking her the horridness of what she's experiencing and the fact that she's losing Romeo right before her eyes. But that's, by the same time, I don't, like, I, I had problems buying it. So that, that simultaneously made the moment work for me, but also made the moment less impactful for me of like, so I what, would, do you think that's like a performance thing from Claire Danes or a direction thing or what? I think it's a direction thing. I think it's, I think it works the lines too. Like, I don't know. It might be a thing where the best situ, the best like context for having Juliet deliver those lines about, you know, let me kiss your lips. Let me get more poison. All these kind of things. It might be that a superior context that works better is to have her in this sort of like kind of shock state of shock where she's not fully taking in what she, what's going on. Um, otherwise, if she's just like uncontrollably sobbing or screaming or trying desperately to to stop what's you know happening before her eyes, it, those lines may not just come out right or whatever. Um, so it might just be something where maybe those lines don't have to happen at all or whatever or whatever. Like I, it, it, the moment can to, work for me. Or maybe like she needs to process the emotions, do the crying, and then try and get the poison off of his lips. You know, like it felt like too. I know what you mean. Like she's like trying to get him to not die and then she's saying the lines and like kissing him and like trying to just have the moment yeah. of his death have her sobbing about it then trying to get the poison from him and then i think cuz you can still dying. have that horrible or you can still have that mm -hmm. amped up tragedy where like she sees mm -hmm. it happening and he's slowly you know and even yeah even exactly what you're saying Miriam where it's like yeah. 
you know, maybe she, there's this moment of like shock as she's looking at him and then he delivers that last line. And now with a kiss or who knows, maybe, or maybe she like desperately, maybe that's the direction she desperately, she looks, she, she goes in to like revive him somehow, like to hug him, to embrace him, to save him in that, you know, primal, whatever base way of mm -hmm. drawing him close and kissing him. And maybe then he delivers that line and then she breaks down and then she goes to the whole poison thing. I don't know. I don't know if that would have been better or, or whatever. Maybe this was the best version and maybe, you know, whatever I can, I can see it in that way. Cause I think the moment still does have merit. The weight is staged and the way it happens as is, but there was that experience. Exactly what you, yeah. like maybe just up. either take that line out and let her just be in the emotions of it or time it differently. Yeah. Totally, totally yeah. See that. Well, I think this, this scene might've been the reason that Leo, well, although they might've already been filming, it seems like this scene is almost reenacted in Titanic, except his female counterpart uh, doesn't have the decency to just uh, do it herself. As soon as he dies, she starts then screaming for help, not screaming for help <laughs> before he dies. It's true. <laughs> Romeo yeah. so that Jack Dawson could run. I do think Jack Dawson is the more grounded version of Romeo, to be honest oh, with you. It's felt for like... Sure. It felt like he's like, oh, this is what I should have been doing is acting like this in that movie. I think it was his well, redo. For and sure. that's the difference between Boz Lerman and James Cameron. <laughs> yeah, I would say Romeo as a character is also just kind of weakly written. Like yeah. they're kind of speaking to what like Matt's sort of like notion of like an, an equal Romeo Juliet thing. Like my impression, I haven't read Romeo or Juliet in a long time, but seeing this movie, like my impression is that like, I just think the characters are written unequally. You know, I think Juliet has more opportunity to demonstrate complexity, right. nuance, thoughtfulness, yeah. and Romeo is just written to be impulsive, direct. He is the teenager committed. in this story. Yeah. Like, she is Which a is... teenage girl. She is making impulsive decisions. Yeah, yeah. She is, like, the epitome of teenager. Actually, no, that yeah. makes sense. Which is what I think... back, like, yeah, most Romeos I've seen are usually better than the Juliet's, but I guess Juliet is probably a harder role. I haven't paid enough attention because I don't care about this play that much outside of this movie. But no, I, yeah, I agree. But I think that's why William Shakespeare took another crack at this character with Hamlet. Because he's like, oh, I didn't do that one right. <laughs> this is crazy. Everyone was annoyed by him. <laughs> so I should redo it. I and make him it's... even more annoying by taking too long to do stuff. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Like, I'm not sure if Miriam, you're like, you're, if it's like a hot take that like Hamlet is just like Romeo 2.0. Or mm -hmm. if this is like some established Shakespeare lore that like, you know, we're just not privy it's to. It's just the thing that like... makes <laughs> sense to me that my teacher told me and I can't let go of. And I'm like, it is the same character. Just opposite <laughs> problems. Yep. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, and does their their lover also die by suicide? Amazing, <laughs> yeah, because, <laughs> because of them. they're so annoying to deal with. You know, <laughs> well, I mean, this is like the thing that I that keeps bringing me back to Shakespeare is just there's always room for things to be recontextualized or reinterpreted like that. Like now, the next time I go see Hamlet, that's going to be my exciting way to to view it. But I guess that's a let's transition back to the whole the Marcuccio mm -hmm. conversation yes. and the gay coding um, and whether or not he's in love with Romeo. But something that struck me in my most recent viewing was and I don't know if this is a discussion that people have had, but I'm wondering, like, does anyone else get the vibe, at least in this movie, that maybe there was something going on between Tybalt and Mercutio, like before mm -hmm. the movie started off screen? I feel like there's tension between them if there's. And I don't know, I, I painted a picture in my mind of what a backstory could be if there was something between those two. And it makes Marcusio's death scene like way better. That's all I have to say. Sorry yeah. To no. yeah. Tybalt is like, like he's a little flamboyant in, in this film. Like he's dressed well and he's he's got like, but I don't know if that's like the character actor. I'm so used to that guy like in, in certain John roles. John Leguizamo? Yeah. yeah sure. Good. Like yeah. I'm, I'm so used to him like being flamboyant and and whatnot and like extra in that way that like I don't know if that's just me picking up on him versus picking up on the way the like Tybalt is supposed to read in yeah. the in the movie, but uh, but I mean yeah I could I didn't I didn't think that myself but I I wouldn't mm. have a problem with I it. I feel like Mercutio <laughs> has something going on with Romeo. Yeah, I feel like Mercutio is desiring general... Romeo. In mm -hmm. general, with the Montague boys, like he's their like 
cool hang around guy and whatever happens happens you know yeah we there. also think of it as like through the lens of teenagers right like this actor definitely feels older than that but in the play i think they're supposed to be the same age but like what do boys do when their main guy gets a girlfriend they like get mad and they're like where have you been we should have been hanging out he's like we do this every day i was with my girlfriend doing something different like cool it <laughs> so it feels a little like that to me too but i can see the lens of him being in love with romeo definitely yeah and i think i've heard uh, more than one person say that like mercutio is not uncommonly cast as being older than the rest of the montagues just to kind of put the spin on it like this is the guy who's like his other friends have outgrown him so now he's just moved on to younger people that kind of match what his maturity mm -hmm. level is and see i always thought Mer of mercutio to be kind of like the cooler older like right? yeah like the kind of like kind of yeah like like the just like i don't know the yeah the guy who like who's wiser more mature understands the way of the world more and so that moment where he's like you know he's he's defending romeo there's this sort of element of like uh, he he's calculated he knows what he's getting into and but for i don't know like there's because the whole like and this movie i have a little issue with the way they do the mercutio, mercutio tybalt fighting thing but to me there's there's supposed to be a bite to when mercutio dies and he curses both their houses there's supposed to be a bite to why he's also condemning romeo because it's supposed to be, the, there's supposed to be this like element of it's not just like, ah, shucks, I'm dead now. I'm gonna like, I'm pissed yeah, off. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. That would, that's what I'm saying almost confirms it because he is stand that moment that you're speaking of. He's yeah, standing yeah. up for Romeo. Yeah. Like he's like, I can't take this guy treating you like this. I'm gonna stand up for you. And then he's very sad and mad that this is all over a the girl that he's just met yet he's always been in his life that's why i felt like he was cursing romeo was like i've been here and now this has all happened over this chick you just met so that might be a valid like explanation for what we see in the film and maybe like and maybe as an uh an alternative but to me from the, from my, the I, i'm recalling yeah from the play I'm recalling Merc the, the the bite that I remember interpreting. The reason why Merc it made sense for Mercutio to curse Romeo or, or his house was because he was he felt like he either miscalculated or was tricked into the scuffle that ended up killing him. Where basically it was supposed to be something where he was just like like he was stepping in as the wiser, more experienced person, like almost like if you will, part like expert duelist. Like, oh, I'm not gonna be the one to walk out of this harmed i'm like i i have enough experience and expertise that i can handle yeah. myself and then also maybe like maybe almost a sense of this isn't as like i'm stepping in not to well no that's that's actually not true because the dialogue the dialogue does he, he does he, he he goes right in with like a basically like i'm gonna kill you or whatever if, if that's in the play the like i want to take one of your one of your nine lives then then he's he's pretty much referencing the more you know the 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 possibility of death from the bat off the bat um but yeah it's more so that more so that expert duelist thing where it's like he comes in and he has he seemingly he has no reason to suspect that he's going to be hurt and the fact that he is hurt he feels like again a, a, a miscalc a, a misplay on his part that he's kind of he's out of insecurity maybe replacing the blame on Romeo and be like you know what ah screw you I would this never would have happened if it weren't for you Screw, yeah. you know curse on your house yeah well i think uh, the reason that i'm i'm now very pro mercutio plus tybalt and also mercutio plus romeo is that i i feel like there's so curse on both your houses to me only has weight if he has investment in both the houses and like i've never really cared about um about that line like people make a big deal out of it i'm like i don't i don't understand why but if well, there yeah. is like, a thing with him and tybalt i think the thing with mercutio that we see sometimes is that even though he is in the play, the action of the play very much affiliated with the Montagues, he is also kind of a neutral zone person. Like at least in this movie, he has the invitation to the Capulet party. I can't remember if that comes from the text or not, but he is definitely kind of in a middle ground between the two of them. And so I feel like there's, there is an inherent tragedy if 
let's say he's either in love with or has something going on with Tybalt, and then he also has a similar relationship with Romeo, if because of both of them, that's the reason he dies, like, that's really sad. Anyway, that's sure, my yeah. current hot take on Mercutio. But also, like, what's the deal with the Queen Mav speech? Because that's another thing people love, and I still don't really understand it. Um, I know that what I've heard a lot, it, one of my favorite takes on the Queen Mav speech was someone who contextualized it as he is somebody who's he fantasizes a lot, but he's also emotionally and mentally unstable. And Romeo is the one who keeps him focused and grounded. And that's why he needs Romeo. And then kind of the potential loss of Romeo means him losing that security, I guess, that he has in the Queen Mab scene. We sort of see it like Romeo brings him down with um, something like Peace Tybalt, thou speaks of or not Tybalt, Mercutio, thou speaks of nothing. And he says, I speak of dreams. Um, so, yes, yeah, so what does everyone make of the Queen Mab speech? Why is it there? I still don't really know. And I don't like it. Well, I always interpreted it like, and I, I mean, I, I want to say there has to be some kind of either agreed upon Shakespearean interpretation, i.e. like Queen Mab is a fairy tale character in the mythology of Shakespeare that represents this and that. Oh, yeah. Well, like um, the basic broad strokes is that he's telling a cute fairy tale that starts out really innocent and then it gets kind of inappropriate and then, and it, get, then it gets uncomfortable. So he's yeah, a yeah. really happy place. He goes from like Disney Cinderella to Grimm's brothers. But I'm what I'm saying is that like, because what he's basically the story, of, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, yeah. the broad strokes is that he's basically telling a story of like how men get screwed over by their whatever passions, romantic feelings, mm -hmm. something to that effect. Like the queen is his tale is I, you know, this dream about whatever. I don't, I don't remember the details, but that's the vague, my vague recollection is there's, it's relevant to it's there's a story of queen Mab and the way Marcusia tells it is rel relates directly to what we've, what we see Romeo talking about, you know, preceding it right about being heartbroken and whatever and he's like ah i see that queen mad mad's come to you and here's what queen mad does and that's why it makes i'm my claim that queen mad came to you makes sense because of this anecdote this story of what queen mad is um so doesn't romeo also say he had a dream like right before this and i think yeah. The way I've always interpreted it is it starts with Mercutio basically being like, okay, get over it. Dreams don't mean anything. Listen to this crazy story, you know? And then at the end he goes, you speak of nothing. And it's kind of like, yeah, point proven. Yeah, that's like, true. Because mm -hmm. the, the dream is really Romeo knowing something bad is going to happen as a result of the party. You see this really well in West Side Story when Tony's like, I have a feeling something's coming. And I can't stop it, right? Like that whole song that he yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. That's this moment. And Mercutio's like, oh my God, we're just going to a party. Dreams don't matter. Listen to this stupid thing. And it's really heightened for him because maybe he's had to give this speech to Romeo more than once is what I have to well, assume <laughs> with this guy. So I don't know. I, also, he's on drugs in this movie, so it's like very scary. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense yeah. for, with the drugs in, involved. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about this. I movie. love that actor too, by the way. Oh, yeah. Matrix okay. Reloaded. Well, uh, Omar like, mentioned uh, a little while ago, like best character performance is amazing, heartbreaking. We got to a plague on both your houses, and I know, like generally, I think the consensus is that no matter how people feel about this movie, they feel like this guy is one of the best Mercutios to ever yeah. mm -hmm. like what yeah. is like what are specific things about his performance that stand out for anyone in this chat like does he have any interpretive moments that that you really like i mean it's really shallow but i i think he's really great at lip syncing young hearts mm -hmm. run for when okay. i was a kid and watched this movie he was the character that stood out the most to me above and uh, honestly above leo too like going every time i rewatch this movie i remember him more than anybody else um, and I think that's just because he gives a wider range of emotion than any other character has to give in this movie. Like, he has to yeah. be happy, he has to be sad, he has to laugh, he has to cry, he has to die, he has to be full of life. Like, this character in this particular iteration has to give so many faces in less time than many of the other characters on screen. So, yeah. that's he's also about unhinged in a different way than Tybalt is unhinged, and he had mm -hmm. to make that distinction. And I he's don't not know evil. what it 
yeah, I don't know what it is. Like, yeah, I get a, a menacing sense from Tybalt. And I get a very fun party, but you don't know what's gonna happen with this guy. Like, don't push it because which if you've ever the really spent can a turn full really night quick. at the gay club, totally. <laughs> um, also, the scene where all this happens is shot so perfectly. You don't like nothing. They're just hanging out, and he's like being a weirdo and shooting fish in the water, right? And Benvolio's like, can we get out of here? I feel like something bad's gonna happen. And if you're the whole scene is like this green cast, even if you don't know what's about to happen, you're uncomfortable in this scene, even before Tybalt shows up. So I just I always think about this scene as like it, especially compared to the 70s version of this movie, this scene doesn't have that big of an impact. Like when it starts, you're kind of just like, Oh, is any other day in Verona, whatever this one, you're like, no, this has a very weird tone to it and it's uncomfortable. And I, we, we all need to get out of here and then they don't. And then it all happens. Right. So yeah. the, the and, cinematography and production design and lighting on that scene mm -hmm. in particular, in combination with Mercutio's performance, like, absolutely cut, cut then with a scene of juliet like daydreaming about how magical it's going to be with oh, romeo yeah. meanwhile they're all killing each other and she has no idea like yeah. just interjecting that one little scene was like oh my god so jarring and then it goes back to like romeo screaming in a car and you're like oh my god <laughs> she has no clue yeah, this uh, them killing each other that leads me to another point, which is one of these like idiosyncrasies, if you will, of the modern of the modern uh, aesthetic or setting. The guns, the the guns on the one hand, they're funny, and the way they introduced the beginning with like the, their their like designated swords, sword like, savior, the sword brand, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like it. Rapier that's so nothing. funny. Yeah, it's but funny. it's great. <laughs> on great. the other hand, I did find that the how the deadliness of handguns is like it's so much greater than swords and daggers and like the in terms of the ease at which you can kill somebody uh and and so the way they're like it didn't quite translate for me so like you know but like the whole even the sequence where romeo like mercutio dies and then uh romeo's like chasing after tybalt and and tybalt's like kind of like he doesn't, he doesn't quite. I don't think he, he ever really points it directly at Romeo at that moment. He kind of points it like in his direction, but like so he's not committing, right? There's the whole sequence. He like he like holds Romeo at bay and then turns to run and drops the gun, and Romeo picks it up and bang, bang, bang. There's like that whole thing where Romeo then is like immediately kind of shocked at what's happened. That's a little iffy for me, where I'm like, you were chasing after him murderously clearly and and if you wanted to like like really hurt him without killing him don't use a gun and <laughs> and and this movie kind of the way they do the whole like the the, the nonchalance and, and like mercutio in the earlier scene shooting in the air to get romeo's attention <laughs> whatever that what is he saying like you come to the party or whatever i don't even know what he's asking him like romeo we were talking like the, that thing with the guns, the handguns. That's kind of a little bit like ah, I don't know that it works. I don't know that it translates. But it I guess on that note, did you did you not appreciate that they were able to find a way for Mercutio to still get stabbed with the like the glass breaking and using the shard? Well, I did, but it's also it's also it's also like, what are you gonna do? You're gonna like, I mean, I, I guess technically you could have just had him get shot, but and and because he because he just dies. So on the one hand, my mind goes to like. Okay, the script necessitates him to not be shot because <laughs> because he has really to die slowly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And On the other also, hand, also I gotta say, also that kind of fed into this whole set production, like this production design aesthetic of like he lands on a mirror, like mm -hmm. it was very in the aesthetic, like, <laughs> and I that this was the first time I was able to really like look past that, like I like and see it for what it was. That whole area is just set up. I mean, it's it's set up for them to eat up the scenery. Like you yeah. are supposed to eat up the scenery there, and they keep going back to it, right? Like because that's also where they got ready for the party. Because it's and, supposed to look like a stage. Yeah, and it's also in the like opening credits, like 
slide if you have the digital copy or whatever it's just like keep going back there for sure yeah yeah cool. so I it's feel cool like and they, scary they, like I always remember being scared of that it's set, very even when they're getting ready for the party. Yeah. yeah and when they roll the blue clouds in during all of that like all that that post-production mm -hmm. like weird lighting stuff going on like that was just magical but like I feel like in that particular scene they're feeding into that like they mm -hmm. really are using it um and to that point that scene when he's dying of the slice right here is another scene where it is painfully obvious that they strayed away from blood like yeah, yeah. you don't even know what has happened you're like oh, yeah and like fine. i guess even there's a little bit of live. like blood and, there but yeah, also it's not bleeding out like, he's fine he's just also when, I yeah understand. when juliet shoots herself as well like, yeah oh yeah that was yeah, a big one like, just the, the lightest the volume spray. And then the that... white linen is clean. Yeah. yeah. It's the lightest yeah. spray on Romeo's yeah. face, right? But he's that still God, pretty. That Magnum, that giant ass pistol. <laughs> just like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would prefer the to see Romeo's face versus. Like, I don't want yeah, to see yeah, her, her cute little, little face little head little. blown off. That ruins the tragedy. No, I don't. Then, I, then give, I was fine with it. but Get a little also. purse pistol. You know, those little. Yeah, like, <laughs> those little, exactly. Don't make it like, grizzle glove. And make a little pop sound. <laughs> like, what? Don't give me no. a bazooka exploding. <laughs> and but, the giant, gosh darn, you know. Yeah. And Nine like, I have to pull this thing back with my whole <laughs> So obviously they still wanted Mercutio to be stabbed, but they didn't care about that with Juliet's death. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah right. So it's, the gun, it is so. interesting. Because yeah. I think at that point, honestly, like also they're trying to tell this story of 90s gun violence, which thanks, yeah. Boz Lerman. We all listened. Doesn't sound like the rest of America did. <laughs> Sorry about it. Uh, but like, uh, I, it's just like, I think that's driving that point home. Also, mm -hmm, this whole thing, it would have been easier for her to burn herself to death in that church at that point, honestly. Yeah, just like your oh, that would that would be a terrible way to go. Well, <laughs> no. all the options, I think there's a lot more, there's a stronger impact to like the sound that comes with the gunshot, especially with how quiet yeah. it is when it happens. Yeah, well, dramatically, I think the gun out of all the options, like 96 Juliet has for unaliving herself, I think that's the one that makes the most sense. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the okay. algorithm's already already borked. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we don't need that alive. <laughs> yeah. K Dog and Fisher here. Sorry, I forgot to say hi to Funko friends. We love them. Um, bringing up what happened to Jesse Bradford? Swim fan. He's in Swim fan. What? That's Found my like, the fan. best movie he's ever been in. Oh yes, yeah, I don't think, I don't is think that he's a 2023. I think it's the one. The... Before, I thought he meant Benvolio, but yes, yeah, I'm fan. looking it up right now. It is so him. Get... Yeah, it's him. Yes. Oh yeah, I didn't. I didn't get this out. Uh, oh. Jesse Bradford was the uh, became the proud father of a baby girl in 2021. Wait, life father. Oh, wait, can't confirm <laughs> if he's proud or not. The article just says he's the father. <laughs> we just have this in. We have to redact. <laughs> swim fan was right. a long time he wasn't ago. swim fan. Has he done anything recently? You know what, Kato? Hey. I'd like to know how old you are then. <laughs> 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 wait to see if they respond. <laughs> wait, wait out me, you think? <laughs> Even though I already announced my agent. Okay, but that the the thing that I never got to say was that yeah, when we first see Balthazar in this movie, that when he's sleeping in the car, that shot really looks like Matt to me. I thought I was. He does, he does I did a double take. Matt. At I was time, like, did sure. you think it was me? In I didn't. I didn't think it was like I. I. I was like, oh wait a minute. Matt I, was like, busy doing I, Disney Adventures exactly. in 1996. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that is my claim to fame. Oh, Alex isn't on Instagram. He doesn't have context for that. No. Oh, I was in a Disney magazine when I was younger. Um, Why would I have to be on Instagram to find that out? Because I posted. Guys, what's this here? It's Ben. Hey, Ben. It is quality boss. It's also, some quality bad boss. Yeah, boss, yeah. Ben, ben, ben is a boss stand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true, Elvis. But yeah, let's. Yeah. Uh, let's well, I'm gonna put Matt for Scar up on. I feel like if we're just gonna say the first name, I want to say Baz, Boz Lerman or whatever. Boss, yeah, is good, but I don't want to say Boz. 
I'll say Baz. <laughs> I'm just gonna say the one name. I'm gonna say Baz. <laughs> like, 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 hey, Baz. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> Um, that's right yeah, if, if this doesn't make sense watch the video i posted today uh yeah, you'll, you'll have do. content not very many people did um but yeah while well, i'm trying to convince the lion king toronto to give me an audition even though i'm sure they are they still auditioning i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i mean i they guess they can always it's an empower to always do it that show's going to be here for over a year they're gonna have to bring in a new cast eventually and probably so, why long game hashtag matt for scar uh there we go <laughs> Uh, yeah, Ben. It's biz. Apparently, it's biz. It's not biz. Get out of here. <laughs> You're trying to biz say with an Australian accent, Ben. Australian. Yeah, thank you. It's biz. Baz. It's biz. Wouldn't, from Australia, it's biz. wouldn't it be Baz? Baz, really Baz, 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 oh, Baz is Baz. biz. We, we have some more insight Crikey, into the dog's age um, and or fish's age. So 22 years ago, I was still older. That makes sense. I would have been 14. That makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. Some pan. <laughs> I reference that movie more than I should, and I totally forgot he was that. in it. <laughs> right? <laughs> this um, is why we're cautious of men. It's yeah. Okay. Or expensive. anybody, really, because the chicks Yeah, that was a girl one. being psycho but in that one. Cautious of people. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wish I had uh, context, but we'll we'll do swim fan month one day. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, hate it. I thought Wait, that movie it with not uh, your kind of film. Is it the, not the teacher no, and the two girls? Is it? No. I, I imagine it's kind of like teaching Mrs. Tingle meets Fatal Attraction with a pool. No, it's just teenage muck. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's not worth watching. No, he's the best biz in the biz. According to no, bat. Oh, I, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, can I say? Biz. Can I say this real quick? I had never seen Strictly Ballroom, and I watched it last night. How is it? It was very boring. Yeah, that opening you know, the opening title credits with them dancing is the best part, and then you can turn it sure, off. Sure, but it was like dirty dancing with no money. Yeah, mm -hmm. Did dirty I was like, have like a low like, budget dirty dancing. I liked, I yeah, liked imagine that. That were like this on people when they were like, oh! <laughs> like I liked that a lot. Um, but other than that, I was like, wow, this doesn't look anything like a Boz Lerman film, in my opinion. <laughs> They all have to learn. Not... Yeah, and then so, lose themselves with their last but project, Elvis. It won like a ton of Where awards. Did you go? Oh, we love Elvis here. We're oh, yeah. we we not yeah, fan. we're big Elvis. We fans. Elvis. But I don't what like Elvis that? as a person or character thing I want to learn about. So maybe that was my mm -hmm. block there. That but... does I think that heavily affects well, you. Ain't nothing yeah. like a hound, but a hound dog. How many times did Ben <laughs> see it? I feel like. Oh, God, in things. theaters, Ben, was it three times in theaters? Really? I feel like it was three times in theaters. I still I, haven't seen like, it. I, was, I, I, I enjoyed Elvis, but hearing Ben's take on Elvis made me just... It put Love me it more. A place where I was like, this is the greatest movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Miriam, if you listen to Ben's take on Elvis, you'll be like, oh, my God. <laughs> Five <laughs> times. I'll listen to his take on it. Maybe it'll change your mind. <laughs> Um, also, while we're while we're here, the cinematographer has anybody looked up what the cinematographer has done? In addition no, wait, to wait I want to guess though. Wait, has the cinematographer done things we've all heard of, like high profile things? Oh, yeah, okay, hold on. Um, oh, wait, are they the other Baz movies? Biz movies? There's, probably, there's at movies? least one other Baz Lerman film, but he has worked a lot with one other very notable director. Ooh. I feel like he probably, as far as Bos Lerman, definitely did Moulin Rouge with the like tight. I would. Shots. Oh, I was gonna guess. Most of the team was the same for Moulin Rouge. Mm -hmm. with this movie. That makes sense. So another movie that he would have done, huh? Um, or another director, not Tarantino. Tarantino. No, is <laughs> no, no. Never that. gonna guess. The styles are like not even. The I'm gonna, At least I don't think. So. I feel like I'm gonna guess like Wes Anderson or something. No. no. Uh, Christopher Nolan. Your close first name is the same. Christopher Chris Reeves. Nope. 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 <laughs> Just tell us. We've we've run out. Hey, we've given up. It's Chris Columbus. He worked oh. with Chris Columbus on. Hold on. Let me go back to the first Chris Columbus. Harry Potter. Was Mrs. Mrs. Doubtfire. Nine months. Stepmom. Hold on. I think there's another one down here. Nope. Those are the three big ones. <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire. Like, yeah, <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire. 
like crazy. And then he did Stepmom. He did Nine Months. He also did, hold on, where's the other one? Patriot Game, Parenthood, uh, Predator. He wow. did Down and Out in Beverly Hills. He did Moulin Rouge. He did Anger Management. He did the time machine. He did, oh, the 2003 Peter Pan Vince. Please tell Lisa. Please tell Lisa. (laughs) Vince is still in the chat. Please tell Lisa. He did the Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He did X-Men Origins. The BBC? Uh, He did Ender's Game. He did A Stitch in Time. I just, I'm like, what? This guy's done so many movies, and they're all very vastly different, Mm -hmm. I feel. So I don't know. I just thought the cinematography in this movie is bonkers good. Mm-hmm. It's good. It's good. It says they should change Columbus Day to be about Chris Columbus. Yes, I've so- said this before. <laughs> yeah. Have I told my 100%. Chris Columbus story on this channel? I can't remember. I don't know. I have a Chris Columbus story. I have a Chris Columbus story, but I don't think I can tell it on this channel. Oh, tell us off air. That'll be fun. Yeah. I like this Columbus story, just that I did background work for a movie he directed um, that was shot in Toronto, and it was terrible. That's, that's the movie great. was terrible. Your experience oh, was terrible. Fear. And the movie, I thought the movie was fun. It didn't get good reviews. It was Pixels, the video game movie. Where the video oh, games, it did not get good reviews. I it didn't get great it. reviews, but like just the the days, it was two days for me on set, but also within like the background actor community in Toronto, it just became the project that people knew was going to be a terrible day for you. A lot of people like were doing 12 hours of just running from imaginary things and like they didn't get paid extra for stunt work athletic, ability. athletic ability <laughs> yeah. special, or special skills <laughs> yeah we were in a giant field that was apparently like property of the toronto zoo when i was told i got to go to the zoo for two days i thought i'd be watching animals and sitting on a bench that was not the case <laughs> it was a big field they put up a big giant green screen that eventually became the white house it's the last scene in the movie when they come back from space and there was like maybe three porta potties for probably i would say five to six hundred people um they cut our lunch break because they didn't want to lose sun and the moment okay the moment i knew that this just wasn't great was yeah they were treating us not well which is not uncommon unfortunately for background actors but i turned and i saw jane krakowski sitting on a milk crate on her phone because seemingly i don't think they gave her like a trailer in this specific location or she just decided she wanted to sit on a milk crate but for me that was the moment i was like if jane krakowski Tony Award winning Jane Krakowski, who gave us Betty Rubble in Flintstone's Viva Rock Vegas. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and won the Tony for um, being the mistress in nine. If she doesn't even get a chair and she has to sit on a milk crate, something here is wrong. And I blame Chris Columbus. But that said, I do love most of his movies. So <laughs> separate the artist from the art, the director from two of the worst professional days I've had in my life. That's my Chris Columbus story. <laughs> Who's ready for the game? <laughs> game time! Let's do it. I'll, I want to shout out the... Uh, I, I don't have the actor's name memorized, but he's also one, another one of my favorite actors. The uh, he's, he's British, and he always plays the British thing, but the priest. Oh, mm. oh yeah. From James and the Giant Peach. Yeah, yeah well, from oh, yes. Dragonheart is my classic film for him. But yeah. Um, him. I never seen him doing a non-British accent. And granted, I don't think his American accent or like his non-British accent is like superb. I can hear his British coming out like all the time. But... I'm so happy that I got to see him put yeah. on a, like not his. I accent always wanted accent. to see him yeah. in an ob in an omen or an exorcist film, and I don't think he ever did either one. And I thought he would have been perfect for it. I had no context for who that guy was until you just said James and the Giant Peach, and now I know. Yeah, yeah Dragonheart. <laughs> he's uh, he's in a number of things. But... Is he like yeah. a fantasy film actor? Is he like a Hugo Weaving? Where he's just yeah, he usually guy? yeah he usually plays like some fantasy. Uh, he's in. Guy. No, is he in? He's no. usually the narrator or the storyteller. He might be in the Kevin movie. Costner Robin Hood, I believe. Maybe he may be. that makes sense. Yeah, I think he's anyway one of the he would, he men. would be a duck or something. Apparently, Jane Krakowski had a wild story about how she was haunted by a ghost. In oh, that's fun. I love Jane Krakowski. Love it. Okay. Anyway, here we go. So for the game, it's a it's a game we've played before. You're just gonna fill in the blanks. I'm gonna. Oh show wait. You. I also wanted to call out that scene. What what where does it happen? Where the the the, uh, the nurse? There's a sh- there's like she's in the kitchen or something. There's a clo- there's a shot of her ass. It's like Juliet's like staring at. There's like just this one scene. I forget what thing, but it's just like she's like the camera's centered close up on her ass, and she's like rummaging through, and Juliet's like just staring, and then like she like turns around and something. 
<laughs> I was like, yeah, I can't tell. Because like, that it's house anyone. is like definitely not the Capulet mansion. Did she just go to her nurse's house to like bother yeah. her? <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't. So this is the house. This no. is another case of I don't think they built this set, and I don't think they filmed in one location. I think he did like the Stanley Kubrick thing, where he's like, "I like that room in this place, and I like that room in this place, and I like that room in this place." We're gonna film in there, and yeah. we're gonna call it one house. Like that's what this felt like to me. I know most of it was filmed in Mexico, and then a little bit in Miami, and then there was one more location. But I think, yeah, it was. I all think just- are you saying it's not actually a house that has? Three yeah, the beginning things? portrait it was, was Australia. Australia. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Yeah, we know it adds Which to the makes beauty. sense because it's Biz Lerman. Biz Lerman. Biz. 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 <laughs> For the game, I'm going to put a quote up on the screen. You just have to fill in the blank. If all three of you get it wrong, the point goes to whoever had the funniest answer. Usually when we play this game, I'll give a second point if you can like tell me who said this quote. But we're not doing that tonight because oh, okay. I didn't make those notes for myself. And also, most of these are said by the same person. So, Wait, do I need paper and a pen? Um, You can just you can just speak it. You can just speak okay. it. <laughs> well, like it. All right. I forgot so, it again. For our first... Your love says, like an honest man, blank. Wait a minute. Is this supposed to be a character from Romeo and Juliet? Or... This is a quote no, from Romeo and Juliet. Blank. And you fill in the Oh, blank. okay. And I'm almost 99% sure all of these quotes made it into this movie. And and is the blank them, always... Romeo and Juliet quotes, but I think all of these came from the movie. Yeah. Is and the blank always a word? word? Yeah. Is it just sometimes one word? Sometimes it's a phrase. Sometimes <laughs> it's a word. In this case, okay. it's a phrase. Okay. okay. Um, it's four words. Oh. Bum, bum, I hate bum, that bum, I don't bum. know Shakespeare. <laughs> now, I don't think this line is in iambic, if that helps, although it might be. I love says, so like, an uh, that would uh, help uh, if I knew uh, what that uh, was. Uh, okay. Oh, I didn't even talk about how this movie treats iambic pentameter. Oh, you did mention. I, I do enough to that <laughs> regard, like to know that Leo was the only one pretty it much did. flagrantly a- abandoning it and that the one completely adhering to it was the priest. Yes. Actually, no, the nurse is also really good at it, but she's like so good you don't really tell mm-hmm. as much as you do with others. Oh. Um... Oh, no. Okay. I don't freaking know. Let's start with Alex. And I, I encourage you to perform it. Uh, uh, I just... Uh, okay. Perform it. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, well, it's it's going to be offensive if I perform it. I think it's the nurse who says it. I don't know. I can't, I can't so put on So now you're going to be a British accent. person putting on a Spanish accent? <laughs> <laughs> She's not British. She is. Isn't she? The yeah. actress is British? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just assumed. I assumed that... From the Harry Potter movies. Yeah. Well, how do you know she's not Hispanic putting on a British accent in the Harry Potter movie? Interviews. Very well documented. How do you know she doesn't put on a British accent in her interviews? I know. All right. Uh, <laughs> it's like an honest man. Uh, your husband, he will. Your husband be he. Okay. <laughs> Jeanette? I said, love me, sweet Juliet. Okay. <laughs> Miriam? Your love says, like an honest man, you're an idiot, and this is a stupid plan. <laughs> Miriam gets the point. There we go. <laughs> that wasn't four words. You said it was four words. Yeah, oh, but I also said, if you all get it wrong, whoever's answer is funniest. And it was uh, the correct answer is, where is your mother? Oh. The nurse is like, your love says, like a good man, like an honest Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you like, love that. All this mean, talk. Blah, blah, what blah. are you saying? Your love says, like an honest uh-huh. man, where is your mother? That's right. That's right. Next. I remember now. These blank delights have blank ends. Oh. This one. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever, I don't know. It's not that funny. It's funny to me. I love Vince's comment. I would lose <laughs> this game for sure. <laughs> uh, uh, let's that start with one. Miriam. I thought I knew, but maybe not anymore. I think is it these violent delights have violent ends? Maybe. Jeanette? Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I also said violent. 
Alex? I couldn't remember if it was decadent or violent. I went with violent. Okay. Uh, all right. These Turkish delights have burnt ends. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for sure. It has to be. That's <laughs> yeah. It's, it's Lion, the Witch, and the yeah, Wardrobe, so right? That's where we're playing? Well, it, it, the answer is violent. So technically, Jeanette and Miriam both get the point. But if you, they were wrong, Alex would have won that. For <laughs> I know, right? That was pretty so, good. So, so close, Alex. So I'm close. always so shocked that that child sold out his family for Turkish delight. I know, for delight. Turkish delight. It is not. I'm not. Good Turkish delight's good. I oh, like Turkish delight, yeah. but it's not a good enough candy to sell out. Like but the best... Really Fresh, freshly made. Yeah, today, which I've I mean, no it looks appealing in all the movies that it's featured. Only in. raisinets are good enough to sell your family. Out. <laughs> interesting. Oh. Ooh, eggnog, eggnog is good. Uh, maybe an eggnog. That's maybe not like candy. I'll sell, I'll That's sell a family for eggnog. <laughs> yeah, but it's a delicious. Drink. A good martini is good enough. I mean, like, Jesus. Oh, <laughs> you can't drink as much martini as you can eggnog. By God, here maybe comes you the can. <laughs> Buy my blank. I care not. Why am I blank? Oh. 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 By God, here come the Capulets. There's a funny Why answer, and then there's <laughs> a correct answer. It's always the case. This is a very match game question. <laughs> I forget what I he just says. I can't get my answer out of my head enough <laughs> to think of it. <laughs> See that? <laughs> If I hear one of you say the right answer, Let's then I'll say down. that. Oh, Let's God. Uh, by my foot? By my foot, I care not? You can perform it. Um, he's like all flamboyant or whatever, right? He's like, he's like oh, I don't know. It's, it's the perfect way. He's like, it's like, uh, by God, here come the Capulets. <laughs> by my foot, I care not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Miriam? By God, here come the Capulets. By my heel, I care not. Ah, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. What's your joke answer? <laughs> toe. Please make it toe. <laughs> oh, mine? Yeah, yeah. I said ass. I just said ass. <laughs> <laughs> By my ass, I care not. <laughs> By my ass, I care not. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, it was heel. It was heel. So... Sweet. Good job, Miriam. Yay. Okay. Uh, I I blank. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> I asked you, Star. No. Um, okay. <laughs> all right, I got it. I, I remembered it. Okay. Oh, all for the point. Is there a Jeanette? Uh, I just said I curse you, stars. I think it's something different than that, but that's what I said. Okay. Alex? Isn't it? I remember. I remember seeing it in the movie and then thinking it's different from the meme you sent me. Like the actual line. I mean, it might shock you to know not all the memes I send you are vetted and accurate. <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that. As, uh, I'm just, I'm just saying it was notable because I was exposed. The first time I was exposed to that sequence was the meme that you sent me. And then when I was watching, I was like, oh yeah, that's that funny meme that Matt sent me that was funny in the time. But the way this guy says the line, it's different. And I feel like it's not just I defy you stars. It's some there's something incorporated in between I and defy. So is your answer? It's like, it's like I do I do defy you stars, but it was not it was something worse than that. It is was it like can I defy you stars? It might like I don't know. I'm gonna say defy and okay. we'll find out what the answer is. We'll find out. Miriam? I defy. Defy you, stars. See, Miriam knows it's defy. <laughs> but 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 so but the, but the line isn't just "I defy you, stars," right? I it think is. In the movie, it is. I don't know if it is. In, in no, text. in the movie. Is it not? In the I movie, there's Leo, something. He's like, "I defy you." But I, he either says like, "Now I defy you, stars," or something then, like that. Or I think it's that. Yeah, maybe then. I think yeah. Says, then I defy yeah. you, stars. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. the stars did this to him. Yeah, yeah. Slash, like, yeah. Juliet's Juliet's dead. Yeah. Then I defy you, stars. Yeah. Next, okay. blank. Be rough with you. Be rough with blank. I remember this. I think yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jeanette. Love. All right, one for love, Miriam. Uh, if love be rough with you, be rough with love. Alex. 
If Luff be rough with you, be rough with Luff. You're correct. <laughs> is, that, is that your Mercutio? Yeah, see, it's my Mercutio. Be tough with love, <laughs> baby. Come on, baby doll. What's, going on? What's happening? Be rough. Be rough with love. Love, okay. be rough with you. Okay. Love. That's okay. enough of that. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, this is also a Mercutio quote, so I encourage you. It's to Mercutio. Ask. That's my answer. No. All right. Ask for me tomorrow, and you shall find me a blank man. Oh, I remember. Yeah. It's wordplay that English teachers really love. It is wordplay. That English mm -hmm. teachers really love. I don't know why that's true, but yeah. Let's start with Alex. Grave! Ask for me tomorrow and you shall find me a grave, ma'am. All right, very good. Grave. Very good. Jeanette? G-R-A-V-E. Grave, nice. Miriam? Looks like... Ask for me tomorrow and you shall find me a grave man. Correct. It is grave. Next, blank. I hate the word as I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee. What is? I remember it's to it's Tybalt. He's talking to Mercutio. Mm -hmm. But what does he say? Oh, I remember now. You remember now. I remember Good now. Night. You remember. You remember meow. Yeah. yeah. See, I thought so. With the grave thing, it would have been funny if I would have been like, like cemetery, a cemetery man, or you know, graveyard, and then you know, I'm gonna grab, write two but... words and cross one out. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the. I need to think of a joke because I can't think of a funny synonym for this word. Uh... Okay. Well, come to you last, Miriam. Let's start with you. Peace. I hate the word as I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee. Nice. Jeanette? Peace. It was war or peace. I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny one. That's a funny one because of war and peace. Yes. Um, <laughs> Tasha Pierre. Alex. Tasha Pierre. Comet. Uh, yeah. P peace. peace. Comet has no right being a title character in that musical. I will. That's I will true. take that to my grave. True. Um, it was only there for the marketing. Next, I talk of blank, which are the children of an idle brain. Uh, okay, I remember this line. Oh, yes, I think I remember what this is. Mm -hmm. I think. You think? I think, therefore, I am. Descartes. I don't think, therefore I... <laughs> Been funny if you would have like either gone completely off. Yeah. Well, I, so see your shoulder. Right. Yeah. You need to be like, just disappear. I don't think, therefore... <sighs> well, I, therefore I'm you know, it would be funny right. if you'd like therefore I'm, you know, like a, like kind of like the hyphen thing. So right. like, you got cut off because you got you dead. I don't think, therefore that's funny. That's funny. Wacko nailed it. That's good. Wacko, wacko, wacko. Timing is the key to. Do it again. It's again. You need to oh, cut off. Okay, let's go. Um, Miriam. I talk of dreams, which are children of an idle brain. All right, Alex. Yes, that's dreams. Of you just, uh, are the children of an idol. Are, are, are you just jumping on to? I'm a man of honor, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't jump on <laughs> unless okay. I say I jump on. And I said you were free to call on me first. You know, that's your choice. It's your choice. <laughs> yeah, no more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah, it's 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 dreams. It's dreams. Okay. Mm. Younger than she are happy blank maid. Younger than she are happy. Wait. If it helps, this one is an iambic, so it's a two-syllable word. 
Younger oh. than she are happy made. Happy bum bum. Yeah, happy bum bum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Younger mm -hmm. than she are happy to mm -hmm. make. Younger than she are. Oh, maybe. Okay, yeah. Just a synonym to the word that I was thinking of anyway. As it were. Maybe? Is that the. What would be the best word for this? I don't know. <laughs> Yoda guessed Riz for one of them. <laughs> I still don't know what that means. I speak of Riz. <laughs> <laughs> Which are the two of <laughs> Yeah, I hate charisma specifically Hello. with the... courtship and yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. Actually, human Riz mating works, rituals. Riz works for all of these. Mm -hmm. Your love says like an honest man. Riz. These Riz. Delight. Happy Riz made though. That doesn't make sense. Um, Rizlets. By my Riz, I care. Rizlings. I Riz. 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 I hate the word. <laughs> <laughs> As I hate hell. Oh, yeah. Life itself <laughs> and you. Okay. Let's start with Alex on this one. Yes, my answer is um What are you looking maidens, at? Maidens, maidens, maidens. Okay. Happy maidens. Okay, okay. Maidens. Next. Uh I said young wives because I thought it was just wives. So I said See, I did too. Miriam. Younger than she are happy mothers made. There we go. Mothers. Sure. That makes the most. Did you say it was two words or did you say two syllables? Two syllables. Two syllables. Two syllables. Wow. syllables. Yeah. Yeah. And final from the regular round, you blank by the book. Ah, I remember the line. I remember the word. Do you? I claim I do. There's only one way to find out. There is. There is. Let's go. Tell us. Tell us, Alex. Kiss. You kiss by the book. Do you? Okay. You just kissed, and then she's like, you kiss by the book. <laughs> Jeanette? I just said play by the book, because I assume that's where this came from. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Miriam? You kiss by the book. It is kiss. So hold on. How many points do we all have? Miriam? This movie does a lot with kiss. There's that song with the lyrics keep coming, and I'm kissing you, or I kiss you, or whatever. That happens mm -hmm. all, a lot of times. A lot of kissing, whether actual or verbal in this film yes this movie was well to miriam's point with the costuming and hair design but also the movie and set production started and also carried on a somewhat already started like really revved up a an aesthetic for young girls in this country of cathedrals yeah. slutty cathedral look is what i like to call it Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it went with the with the nice crazy like Miriam said crazy detailed hair that somehow looked effortless. Uh, yeah. the, the, Let the me tell you that lights. halo that halo hair is effortful, and I still after fifteen years of doing hair cannot do it. So I don't know how they did it. Yeah. Also I, I, on I'm the sorry, sorry the extras on this DVD or digital copy show you how they film that kiss in the elevator, and it is truly. Incredible! If they you get a chance to watch to, it, show me a kiss. What? Yeah. Really? So since they filmed it in like a circular shot, they had all these panels, and they had people who had to lift each panel as the camera. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. And cool. put it back in place as the camera is like then panning to it. It's really cool if you can watch it somewhere. Not as cool as Bullet Time in the Matrix, but still really cool. There you go. And when are, Same. When are we doing Same Matrix thing. month? You're well. We'll see. Uh, speaking of the Matrix, I'm excited for you to see Titus. <laughs> yes, I am very excited to see Titus. It was made around the same time, and they do they do the Matrix effect at least once. From what I, time. I'll blow time. Yeah. I think it might happen more than once, but I know there's at least one scene where they do, like, there is Matrix action happening. It's, it's bullet time. It's, it's yeah. called bullet time. Okay, it's bullet time, sure. Um, so, here we go. The points are, Jeanette has five. Alex has six. Miriam has a perfect 10. I don't know <laughs> when that has ever happened in these games. So well done. Because so I got the joke answer right. That's, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so now we get to pick how many points we want to wager for the bonus question. Um, there will be, it, it is two parts. It's not the same format. Um, and it's an unconventional bonus question, but you just have to, Go in blindly. How many points would we all like to wager? Alex, we'll start with you. I'm going to do uh, five. Yeah, five. Jeanette? 
All in five. Oh, okay, Miriam. Uh, six, I guess. Yeah, no, okay. one. There's one. Two. Sorry, two. Two. Okay. <laughs> Very smart. Um. All right. <laughs> this is a two-part answer. So if you got one part correct, you will double your, or you will add your wager. If you get both parts correct, your wager will be doubled and added on. And if you get anything wrong, it's subtracted probably. I don't know. So here we go. Here we go. Unconventional, but there is a right answer. There are two right answers. Who is my favorite character in this play and why? And now not the movie, Romeo and Juliet. Who is Matt's oh. character in Romeo and Juliet and for what reason? I had a really good answer if it was about the movie, but no, not the hmm. movie. Hmm. Is it someone that has equal showing in the movie? No. I don't. I don't My know. reasons for loving this character are very well represented in this movie. Okay. Um, I've given very overt clues. Yeah, it's a cat thing, obviously. What's the cat thing, though? Oh, well, that gave it away. Thank you, Alex. Well, he's doing all these cat things. Oh, I know. I'm all... ready. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, let's go with Miriam first. Yeah. It's Tybalt because he's the prince of cats. Yes, that's the correct answer. It's Tybalt because he's the prince of cats. Yeah, what did you say? Tybalt because of cats. Yes, Tybalt because of cats. <laughs> Alex, what did you say? Well, I... I I I'm the one who gave them the ability <laughs> to answer. No, that's Miriam what I already said. had it. You gave Miriam me the ability. Knew. I guarantee Miriam already had it. So once I realized we were doing the cat thing with the pawing of your hat. Yes, I did gather. Yeah. I I say Marcaccio. Oh, that's cute. Because his name kind of sounds like a cat if you say it that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or the Catulets? Or the Montemews? Right. Oh, the Montemews. Montemews, ex catly um, Well, yeah, like it is very much because of the cat thing. But Tybalt, I don't know. Tybalt's just so cool. And also in West Side Story, again, I wanted to be Bernardo, who is the Tybalt. Yeah. I'm always very, I, my affiliation in all iterations of Romeo and Juliet, I'm always very pro Capulet or Capulet adjacent. And I'm anti Montague or whatever the Romeo clan are. Like, I just always find they're more obnoxious. Capulets are better. Anyway, Jeanette, you won because you ended up with 15 to Miriam's 14 after these points did the thing. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't think the Thanks, math Alex. works out that way, but wow. I'm, I'm down with it because either way I lose. But yeah, oh yeah, Alex lost. I don't know if, if Miriam's down with it technically, but I'll, I'll let things go. Yeah, because didn't she say the same thing as me? Miriam did, but Miriam wagered. But I wagered less. Oh. Yeah, but but oh, but Jeanette wagered five, Miriam which equals ten. Miriam wagered two, point. which would equal twelve yeah. total. No, no, but yeah. there's two parts to the answer. So Tybalt and cats, and so Miriam got Miriam. But and then Miriam would have gotten. Oh, 14. that's true. We're getting fourteen. Yeah. You're yeah, right. 14. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was very confused about the point the system. So we'll say it's that. Yeah, that I, I didn't get that we were going to get double the double points, but that's yeah, fine. That's fine. That's where Congrats, it's... Jeanette. Yay, Jeanette. Hey, the ones wagering all the points matters. So. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's the all right. Well, there we are, everyone. So the closing question, it's something that I wanted to ask in the main discussion, but I forgot to. So I'm going to make it the closing question. What is the moment in this movie that is your favorite in terms of like something that's very film specific, something that utilized like the magical power of filmmaking to tell the story in such a manner that maybe couldn't be done as effectively on stage. My answer is the death scene because both how the text was cut, but like you could do that on stage, but specifically because of the intimacy. And that's my kind of, I guess, answer for the whole movie is I think one of my favorite things is that there's so much power to hearing Shakespeare almost whispered 
and being so close up that you just don't have almost the same relationship with when you're watching a performer on stage because it is written to be projected and it works that way but I don't know, just the perspective shift and being able to be really close and to hear it quiet is something that I love about this movie. So the intimacy, the whispering, that's my answer. You can whisper on stage. It's not yeah, a, that's not, not as a good, good reason. It's not you as can, good. Yeah, you can just mic it. I stand by what I said. Mic it. It's not even just the, the tone. You can just mic it. It's being visually yeah, close. Yeah, but, but that's, that's you know, you just, the whisper's not good. Being visually close. Jeanette, what's your answer? <laughs> So it's a tie between the uh, when the storm is rolling in during the Mercutio scene, nice. Mercutio death scene, and the boys at the beginning, because I think those are the two scenes that cinematography and filmmaking affect the most. Um, there's, there's, you know, the jerky movements in the first scene, the lighting in the Mercutio scene. Like, I think those are things that can seem overplayed or underplayed in the case of the boys scene on the stage. Nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, Alex is back. What's up, Alex? We missed you. We missed you. Yeah. Yeah. Miriam, what what what's your answer? Uh, for me, it's the love at first sight fish tank moment. You can't do that. Like what? They just see each other in masks at this party, like on stage. It just doesn't have the same impact as seeing them see each other through the fish tank. And also the pool scene. I think it's a much better interpretation than the balcony balcony he was like hanging off the whole time and like <laughs> can we wrap this up i'm tired and the pool just it just works and they're in Love the pool it. yeah alex i don't I, i'll say i do i i thought it was uh the boys introduction was very entertaining the the, the close up on the uh those killer uh boots that tibolt is wearing i you love i love his footwear um I mean, you could do like a bat out of hell and have an actual camera uh, with a projector screen so you can actually have like, uh, you know, close ups and whatever. So, I mean, you could do your whole intimate like visual effect too on stage. It's all possible. Stage is, is better than film. But um, uh, yeah, no, I think so. So that one kind of to, to piggyback on, on Jeanette's answer. And then alternatively, as kind of like a... Uh, a jokey answer. It's the uh, the uh, the inner monologue that ran arbitrarily happens in this movie. I mean, it's there's the one uh, the most like justified is I think like at the point of the end, there's like an inner inner monologue happening with the um, uh, Romeo where he's like writing shit da uh, down on his uh, little book. But uh, there's like there's the the part where there's one that Juliet does like you know. 70% through the film or something. And I, that was the first time, it, as far as I knew, it was the, the first time they even introduced that in the movie as like text that's going to just happen inside somebody's head and not be spoken aloud. Because she did the whole like laying in bed by herself and daydreaming scene. That was all spoken out loud. But then there's this one scene where she's like, I forget what she's talking about. I think she's maybe worrying well, about something. When she's uh, thinking about what's going to happen when she takes the poison. She's like, is it actually poison? Am I going to die? Maybe, maybe it's that it was something that I remember being like, this doesn't like the text doesn't, it's not like written in such a way where it's obviously a good choice to have this be an internal monologue moment. It's like, be, especially because we've had those moments where they're alone and, and there's, and they verbalize anyway. So I was like, we've already established the convention that you're going to say the text, like, you know, as it is. So giving me this like inner monologue thing why why are we doing that and then like later on it happens maybe once or twice more and those moments are better but the first time it happens which i think is that first time with juliet uh, i remember being like this is it seems arbitrary why are we just doing this is this is this going to come back um so yeah that that the magic of filmmaking you can have internal monologue while the person the actor's not saying anything which technically speaking you could do on stage you could just have somebody pre-record something or say something off stage and it could be the, the monologue but it's harder to like you know, make the audience grasp that that's what's going on. Yeah, you, know, you, you have somebody walk with a sign saying "internal monologue moment." Yeah. You know, <laughs> this is not <laughs> coming from lips or whatever. <laughs> yeah. but, like, I think the the implication with those types of speeches in Shakespeare is that it is an internal monologue anyway. At least when they're soliloquizing, we even reference that in, in Beetlejuice, the musical, when it's like we can hear you. Well, that was a soliloquy, so technically you're the one who's being rude. Like that is well, mentioned that if you soliloquize that yeah 
I don't, I mean, that might be true. And I, that just might be an ignorance on my part, but I never, I've never interpreted soliloquies to literally be that. I, I guess I've always, I've acknowledged that soliloquies are like, they're a verbalization of the internal thought process, but I just took them as, as they are. Like you're just verbalizing what you're thinking. Not that in lieu of me being able to read the character's mind, I'm getting a verbalization that otherwise would be the internal. Difference. Yeah. Okay. Which, but it could be, it could be that case. It could be, which, you know, that's just ignorance on my part. Cause uh, yeah, to me, it's just like, yeah, I mean, a soliloquy is that intimate moment, but kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess bonus answer from me since Alex made me realize that my answer could be done on stage. I enjoy the cutting and the editing specifically within scenes that on the page, I think are uninterrupted flows of uh, dialogue or speech that in the movie they just switch from setting to setting and then it still makes yeah. perfect sense in some kind of montage type specifically like when uh the prince slash police chief is in the helicopter yelling at them then it cuts to them in the like the the police office place since that uh, stretch of speech i think is pretty well uninterrupted on stage but it just works so well switching up the uh the setting and then just for the storytelling i think like things like that to filmicify it are so are so good so good. Love it. Mm -hmm. anyway. Hooray. I, oh, this was so much fun. I love talking Shakespeare. I love talking movies. I'm excited for the next three weeks. Next week, we're back with Coriolanus, the Ray Fiennes Voldemort adaptation of one of the lesser known Shakespeare plays. But it, when I did my video, my like Matt's top five favorite Shakespeare movies, which was critically panned by real Shakespeare fans. And they said that I had no taste and didn't know what I was talking about. That was my number two. So I'm very excited to talk about Coriolanus. This movie was my number three. Actually, that was why they said, you don't know what you're talking about. Because apparently Shakespeare scholars hate this film. But Of yeah. course. We, whatever. Well, yeah, I think it's because of all the things that I feel we've touched on that we appreciate about how things are in some ways chopped up or reinterpreted. Like yeah, Shakespeare they're built Because we like film just as much. Exactly. In my case, more. <laughs> exactly. So yes, Coriolanus next week. It will be a treat for everyone. Uh, but until then... Yeah. Closing thoughts. Just a quick go around. Anything that you want people to know about? No, we'll do that when you sign off. But yeah, closing thoughts on this film. Your last thought that you want to leave people with. We'll start with Alex. Um, did Romeo and Juliet have sex in the play? Yeah. In the movie? Yeah, it's established in the play that they, they had carnal relations. I, uh, I don't remember that part. It's established. It's like, it's very... It's, it's implied. Pretty well accepted like the scene when she when they wake up and it's like was that the lark it was not the lark it was the whatever the like after tybalt dies yeah, yeah, yeah. the last scene together it's very yeah. much implied that like yeah stuff happened the night before okay okay well you know that uh that's an important question folks so just remember that's what alex would like you to know is that the sex content of a film is most important yeah if, if nothing else vince knows yeah yeah, yeah. jeanette um, I guess my thought to everybody is regardless of your opinion of Shakespeare, Leonardo DiCaprio or Baz Luhrmann, you should intake this film because it is a good film and you will find something to like about it because there is something for everybody. Well said. Miriam. Um, if you've never looked at hair in a movie, please use this as your gateway because it helped it. This one tells a story, I think. And if you've never thought about the costumes in this movie mattering, I think they do. So maybe just give it another go. Even like Jeanette said, if you're not a Shakespeare fan or a Leo Boslerman fan. There is something for the everybody. costume designer you should be a fan of. <laughs> I, I maintain I want more Funko Pops of this movie. The yeah, they actually, would be yeah. stunning. I know there's only two. Well, technically there's three. But if they if they do Leo, they have to do his hair, but with like two pieces actually separated, like two little plastic pieces. I think they did separated like this. Yeah, yeah he's mm -hmm. in he's in the night outfit. I think there are. Oh, they things. need to have. I want him the... in the blue shirt. Yeah, oh, they that's need the Viking the heart shirt. Yeah, that's the chase. Yeah, that mm -hmm. one's harder to get. It's worth a lot more. They did make the Hawaiian Ooh. shirt, but it was like a one in six chance of getting it. I don't have that one. I want it though. Ooh. I would also like yeah. Tibbles in one of his. Mary with the metal vest. tipped boots. Yes. I want that. Yep. Yes. I want but also like Juliet yeah. in her angel costume. That exists. That does halo exist. braid and all. Does it have the halo braid? I'm almost positive it does. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. 
Like, I, now I, we know what to get Miriam for Christmas. <laughs> I would love it. I would absolutely love it. <laughs> All right. It's, it's that time, friends. I'm going to highlight you. Tell everyone everything you want them to know about you. We'll start with Jeanette. Hello. So I'm Jeanette. You can find me here uh, on Teacup for One. You can also find me on uh, We Like Theme Park podcast. Uh, new episodes on Thursdays. Um, I'll throw out here that I don't know why we're not doing 10 Things I Hate About You this month. I'll oh, there's a reason. That. There's a reason. Wait, hold on. Oh, is it because we're doing Heath Ledger month? No, it's because, it's because um, I I wanted this to be focused on adaptations that use the text and do either a full marathon or a mini marathon of movies that are adaptations but very close adaptations that very are very close yeah so it would be yeah. like west side story 10 things i think there's an othello called O oh, with julia um, Smiles as well and, yeah. so and it's you should also put she's can oh, you please she's put thin. she's the man that's the other <laughs> that one lives. So, i i want that to be its own thing because oh I my love- god if you do she's the man aaron might come on here. please like like yeah aaron, aaron loves that movie so much um <laughs> who doesn't love that movie yes poor man of Vines. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, so yeah, so you can find me here and then you can find me on We Like Theme Parks and you can find me at TinkerJ787 on Instagram and uh follow along with all the fun I have, whether it's Disney or this or Baltimore or my hometown. So yeah. Yay! Come find me. Thanks, Jeanette. Oh, it's my turn. Um I'm Miriam. I'm also on We Like Theme Parks on Thursdays. Uh, I also have a, a horror podcast called Basically Haunted, and I just started a new uh, book Instagram with some of my friends, and it's called The House of Stars and Swords. So if you are into fantasy novels, please come check that out. And also my regular page is The Churro Fund. There's lots of places you can come find me. <sighs> That's it. Woo. Thank you, Miriam. Alex. Yes, I am Alex. Um <laughs> So, let's see if we can. All right, let's. Uh, hold on. Let's get, 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 get a it. shot of this. Get, get, get a shot of this. By my All heel, right. I care not. All right. All right. Look at that. It it goes behind. I'm I'm doing it, Ma. Wait. Uh, okay. Now. Now for the other one. Okay. 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 Uh, if, if uh, you do the other one, are you going to fall off of whatever chair you're sitting on? Uh, uh, and with that, friends, this concludes yet another episode of the Teacup for One Movie Marathon. My name is Matt, and I have two degrees. Once again, join us next week where we will be discussing Coriolanus, starring Ray Fiennes and Gerard Butler, as well as Jessica Chastain and one of the Richardsons, the Redgraves is one of them. I don't know. We'll find out next week. Thank you, friends. Um, my name is Matt. I have two degrees. What happened to Alex? Whew. You okay? Yeah, that was a bit of a stumble, but uh, you know, we're back. Yeah, you made we it. Made uh, it. No, we're just leaving, though. We're done. Whew. Well, I mean, you might be done, but uh, but that was a rush. I'm, uh, sure I'm going to go again. Okay, well, have fun. Um, thank you, everyone. We will see you next week. Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm doing my guys. See, a, like, can we? we do, I just need to. You do that off air, though. How do? Yeah, we, yeah. Just let's. Yeah, yeah. Can you how just kind of go? Can you, how do you let me? How do you? End, how do you? I got, I got a foot. I got end? a foot that's going behind. How do you? End and another foot. I don't understand. And then.